Very quickly, Steve Bannon was found guilty of contempt of Congress. And uh, well, I guess that's the news. It was kind of to be expected. Steve Bannon was arguing executive privilege. But when he was in was on trial, his defense team actually didn't bring up any witnesses. So many people are thinking this is some kind of bigger play here, that this may be a strategy to go to a higher court. We'll see. We'll talk about that, of course. But this whole political circumstance around the Biden administration and Democrats targeting former administration officials with arrest and investigation. Well, it, it brings us to a dangerous territory with this other story last night. Lee Zeldin, he's a Republican congressman. He's running for governor. Someone tried to kill him. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm seeing all these news outlets saying allegedly tried to stab. But there's a photo of the guy holding a blade in his hand. It's got like two pronged blade. And Zeldin is grabbing his arm to hold him back. I'm like, you can see the guy on camera, like try to go at his neck. So I'm like attempted or alleged. Well, attempted, yes, but like alleged. I was like, you watch, you watch the guy do it. Crazy, crazy stories, man. I did some uh, cursory digging into this guy's background. And I think he might be, I, I could be wrong about this, but just like a default liberal kind of guy, like a regular guy doesn't pay attention to politics all that much, but votes Democrat, radicalized by the January 6th committee and Democrat rhetoric around extremist MAGA stuff. Because we know that Democrats have been funding GOP candidates while simultaneously claiming it's an existential threat. So we'll get into that. We'll talk about that. We also got probably the best story ever. It has been leaked or apparently it's being reported that Donald Trump, should he win in 2024, he will purge up to 50,000 government employees. And it's funny because the media and the Democrats are like, oh, no, he's going to dismantle our government. And I'm like, yeah, yes. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so uh, we'll get into all that. Before we get started, my friends, why don't you head over to TimCast.com, become a member to support our work. And if you go to that members only section, you can see the wonderful Marjorie Taylor Greene. We had her on uh, uh, last night, giving her thoughts on uh, what the Republicans may do in 2022, uh, and, or I'd say 2023 in January when they win, as it pertains to the election in 2020. So that'll be really interesting. As a member, you can watch all of that, as well as our new shows like Tales from the Inverted World. Cast Castle is being expanded into a larger comedy show that will be Tuesday. I think we're doing Tuesday at 7 p.m. But I also want to shout out, so again, become a member. I'll also add, we don't use PayPal anymore. We switch to Parallel Economy, co-founded by Dan Bongino, support companies that don't hate you and Timcast. But I want to give a shout out to our good friend, John Rich. You guys probably know John Rich. He is a superstar, country star. He has released a new song called Progress. Hmm. And the music video and the song itself, amazing. Phenomenal. And, and it's phenomenal. And, um, you know, we, we were like, we got we to help John hit number one. He's already number one. <laughs> oh, yeah. John Rich has already hit number one on the iTunes top charts with his song Progress. And do you know what his song is about? It's about rioters and extremists burning down cities, destroying families. And he's saying, keep, if that's progress, keep it away from me. The song's absolutely fantastic. The video is really, really great as well. So shout out, John. We're big fans. Uh, I guess congratulations. You're number one. You didn't, you didn't need us to shout you out, but we really, really wanted to. Joining us today to talk about all those stories, as well as a bunch of other stories, is Constantine Kissin. Hey. Who are you? What do you do, man? I'm a former stand-up comedian turned YouTuber and uh, just written a book called An Immigrant's Love Letter to the West, which is a Sunday Times bestseller as of today, which I'm pleased about. Wow, congratulations. Uh, but I, I co-host a YouTube show uh, uh, called Trigonometry, and it's two things. We interview people, so it's serious interviews, and also we do something called The Raw Show, which is me and my co-host Francis, uh, both comics, just uh, joking around the uh, events of the day. We do every ridiculous accent under the sun <laughs> oh, okay. uh, just to make fun of everything and don't take anything too seriously. Right on. We also have another story, uh, Twitter banned the word groomer. Mm. They were like, it's a slur against LGBTQ people, so you can't use uh -huh. it. It's like, okay, it's getting a little weird, but we'll talk about that too, for sure. We also have Hannah Claire. She's back. Hi. Yeah, I'm Hannah Claire Brimlow. I'm a writer for TimCast.com. Actually, the person who wrote the story we're going to be using about Steve Bannon. Mm. No <laughs> Nothing like having your boss read your articles on yeah. air. There's a typo here. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, I'm always like, get a copy editor. to. Like, I'm there was a show when I first started where there's a typo in one of my sub headlines. And the next week, Chris Carr joined us. So ah, there you go. Oh, I'll did. just look up and glare if we see something. If I get fired live on air. I'm That'll sure be exciting. <laughs> oh, hi, everyone. What are you doing? Being <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm building a straw He's out busy. of this honey. There's these little packets of honey <laughs> that are shaped like a straw. So I was just clipping off an end and stirring my coconut water into this delicious coffee. 
Uh, oh. Cold brew. I'm Ian Crossland, by the way. Constantine, I'm looking forward to talking about your mm. book. What is it about? Really quick before we get going. Very, uh, very quickly. Uh, I am worried that in the West, we're moving in the direction of the society that I grew up in, which was the late Soviet Union, uh, in terms of many other things that I'm seeing. And I wanted to give people in the West a warning uh, not to go down that road because it's not a very good one. Thanks for writing that. Well, talk more about it mm. soon i feel like i'm interrupting everyone this evening i interrupted hannah claire to bring around the show which is great because she <laughs> kept trying to keep her from being nervous and then ian i'm <clears throat> casting it over to him and he's trying to gnaw on this what anything I'm, I'm sorry everyone i had it coming i'm just here in the corner pushing buttons like i always do let's get going i'm excited to have all right on. the first story on a friday of course it's actually kind of big news steve bannon's been found guilty of two charges in contempt of congress trial it's a minimum of two years for each count but would they really give him that long. Some are saying it's going to be two months. He's going to get the bare minimum. They're going to say two, 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 uh, two months to run concurrently for both counts, but we'll see the story. Steve Bannon said, we may have lost a battle here today, but we are not going to lose this war. Bannon is the former executive chairman of Breitbart News, as well as a former advisor to President Trump. The conviction comes after a four-day trial during which the Justice Department argued Bannon believes he's above the law and showed he chose to show his contempt for Congress, author, uh, Congress's authority and its processes by refusing to comply with the January 6th committee's subpoenas. Well, instead of just reading this, let me just ask Hannah Claire, what, what's going on with the story? Are there any other developments or, you know, what's your reporting on it? Yeah, well, the major thing is that he has been following this line that he was exercising executive privilege from President Trump, that Trump's lawyers had encouraged him not to... Uh, testify before the committee not to submit any documents and they're saying this is within you know official protocol it's acceptable the january 6th committee says no this he knew he was supposed to comply with the subpoenas he has to turn over the documents he needed to testify you have to remember that the january 6th committee has su subpoenaed 100 people the only for other person to be indicted is uh peter, Nav was it peter, peter navarro, navarro thank yeah. you um and throughout the trial it was a four-day trial and we had Basically, the Justice Department saying this is ridiculous. It's simple. He was supposed to be there. And we had uh, Bannon's attorneys arguing that, no, there's precedent in the way. And also, he was in the middle of negotiating terms. We've seen a couple other people. I think Mo Brooks said, yeah, I'll testify before January 6th, but I want it to be televised. I want it to be recorded. There are people who are hmm. uncomfortable with the way this investigation is being carried out. So a lot of the story or a lot of the feeling is that they're trying to make an example of Bannon. Right here, the first thing that comes to mind is, uh, Constantine, is this becoming Soviet-esque? Yeah, I don't know too much about it. I, I, I think it's uh, scary in a different way to me as a complete outsider who maybe doesn't follow the legal details. But just seeing how divided this country is, uh, and I love America, I think it's a brilliant place, but seeing how angry and people on both sides are trying to destroy each other right down, burn everything down to the ground is very worrying because it's not just about America. Like we everywhere in the world, in the UK where I live, we import all of this stuff and then we start doing the same mm -hmm. thing to each other. So it's really, really worrying the way things are going, man. I think um, when you have the, the previous administration and the rival political party arresting the, pre when you have the current administration, sorry, mm -hmm. and rival Democratic Party arresting their rivals and the uh, previous administration, yeah, we're there, man. So Steve Bannon, is uh, let me put it this way the january 6th committee is a sham it's 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 fake it's lies they included me in their evidence so so right, right away i'm already like everybody i know most people listening know this but um were you the shaman guy no no <laughs> they they claimed that uh trump supporters were encouraging people to go down and get violent and they put me in their montage of people because i commented on a comment trump made as I was reading a news article, hmm. I said, Donald Trump says this will happen and it's called for his supporters. So they put me in this montage because their goal is just to lie and drive escalation. What we've been seeing the Democrats do is they've been putting money into Trump supported candidates like Trump endorsed candidates so that they win because they believe come November, they will then beat the Trump candidate, right? They're coming out on January 6th and saying it's an existential threat to our country, but then funding the message hmm. and propping it up. So Steve Bannon gets a subpoena, and first and foremost, he didn't just say, screw you. He said the president has executive privilege, meaning, you know, we don't have to comply with Congress. There should have been, there, there's got to be some negotiation, right? Like, if the, pre, if the they're, they're arguing that Trump's not the president, therefore doesn't count, but I'm like, but he, he was. Like, 
you lose your executive privilege the moment you're out of office, then we'd be going after every single president ever. Why aren't they going after Bush mm -hmm. over, over mm. the, the, the Middle Eastern war stuff? This is purely, I think, we're getting into uh, authoritarian, fascistic, communistic, whatever you want to call it, where there's the uniparty, neocons and neolibs, and if you oppose them, they will destroy you. And the, 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 the people who work in government are just going to, you know, turn along with it. Well, mm. let's remember that the two Republicans on this committee are Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney, who are notoriously unpopular in the Republican Party. I mean, they'll say it's bipartisan, but you have to question why they didn't oppose, uh, uh, appoint someone who had a more uh, opposing perspective from the Democrats that are leaving this committee. It's clearly not something that they were interested in doing. I think with Bannon... Ultimately, he has just become a man with a target on his back. They know that if they can make this advisor to Trump, who is outside, of, he, he represents to a lot of normal Americans, a lot of normal liberal Americans, sort of the fear of who Trump is cultivating or who Trump works with. Mm -hmm. And I think by fine, I mean, I think if he goes to jail for, let's say, 60 days, they also can fine him between 100 and $100,000. So if they hit him with a $200,000 fine, they put him in jail for 60 days, they have sort of landed an arrow on on bannon and that's really all this is tim can i steal man like i'm just curious because i always like playing devil's advocate is what i do on our show so if you just take the steel man version of the democrat argument right that the, what wouldn't they say what happened was on january the 6th was an attempt to overthrow a democracy and we have to make sure this never happens again which is why we're doing this is, is that what they would say so one more time the democrats are arguing that the January 6th, it's an attempt to overthrow a democracy, mm -hmm. and they have to follow the legal process to make sure that never happens again. That's essentially that, their that's argument. That's what they're arguing. And what's wrong with that argument, in your it's opinion? It's not real. Mm. So they're trying to... So I'll give you an example using me. They're trying to argue there was an organized effort, a conspiracy to do to you know overthrow the mm. U.S. government, even though the FBI says that's not true. Initially, they did. Now you've got seditious conspiracy charges, and it's, and it's, it's just... I think it's 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 all fake for a variety of reasons. One, you've got they had this unnamed co-conspirator and the guy actually exp like revealed himself saying like here's the chat messages. We were saying no violence. It was like it was like criticizing people who are arguing for violence. You've got Ray Epps for instance, this guy who's out in the street on camera telling people to go in, no charges, the media defends him. The reality is there were no cops uh, uh, pr protecting the perimeter. Like there was no substantial police force. There were some cops. Police opened the door to the Capitol. Did you know that? Yeah. Police opened the door. They fanned people in. There was a riot at one side, and there were people shoving their way in some areas, and maybe half or, or, of the people who walked in were invited in by the police. The cops mm. opened the doors, waved them in. Oh, no. The, all of this I agree with, and I, I totally accept. I guess what I'm saying is I think from, the, from their perspective, a more plausible explanation is they thought Donald Trump was Hitler, right? Yeah. And then his supporters stormed the Capitol. Storm inverted commas. Well, I mean, if if their perspective is based on the fact that they're wrong, oh no, I, well, then I'm they not can believe unicorns sure, exist. I, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying I think the reason that they're behaving in this way is they decided the evil Hitler and his supporters did this. No, they're they're funding they're funding these people. You you think it's deliberate? I mean, it's I don't think it's reported mm. ver fact that the Democrats Governors Association put 1.16 million dollars into who's Dan Cox. Uh, yeah, Dan Cox of Maryland, he's running as the public they, candidate for governor. They're literally funding the people they claim are threatening democracy. Well, so there's no way they believe that's it, true. It's not monolithic, though. The Democrats, is, it gets kind of vague because when Marjorie Taylor Greene was here last night, I listened to you guys talking. She was saying the Democrats want to. She's talking about the Democrat congressmen and women. But when you say the Democrats, you're talking about like the Governor's Association, yeah, the, the actual the Democratic voter, National Committee, the and and the voters are a bunch. And, and, and sometimes are, are the voters themselves. Naive, ignorant people who are marching in lockstep with fake news. Because the people right. that uh, assign themselves Democrat when they vote are considered Democrats, but they're not the Democratic Congress people. So it's, it's a lot of disparate We're, we're talking about the political party. It's just such a large disparate it's faction all of, of people. It, 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 it is. Like some want this, some want that, some think it was... No, 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 you're, 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 this is not, not the point. The point is there's Democratic leadership and infrastructure and the infrastructure and power and leadership and money is, is, has an agenda and a goal. 
True, but to say that because the Democratic Governors Association is funding uh, Trump candidates doesn't mean that all Democrats are funding Trump candidates. No, it means the Democratic establishment is applying resources in that direction in many ways, while simultaneously the same establishment is screaming that this is the end of democracy. So who controls the Democratic establishment? Uh, I mean, you can point to a handful of people. For a while, it was Hillary Clinton. I don't. Uh, uh, you can say Barack Obama was the leader of the party. There's a bunch of people involved. There's John Podesta. But I don't know... You know, at this point, it seems like it's fractured and falling apart. Mm. And so that could be uh, why it seems chaotic and it, it seems so insane. It, it, it used to very much be that there was uh, there were prominent individuals that you knew were running the show. If you take a look at uh, back in 2020, when when uh, the Boston Globe reported on the war games they were doing, you can see who it was. It was Hillary Clinton's campaign staff, former campaign staff. It's Joe Biden. And, but you look at the Biden administration, and it feels like they're the Democrat Party is a chicken with its head cut off running around randomly spraying things around. The body is still there. You know, it's still moving around, but it's lost purpose. So that's why I think it's it's so dejected and insane. Mm. But uh, yeah, simply put, the Democratic voter base is 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 the uh, the voter of believing Jesse Smollett. Sorry, that these are the people who believe Jesse Smollett. Right. But this is exactly what my point was going to be, because what I see on the left is a bunch of overreactions, sort of like tr like AOC. Every time something happens, like it was like a terrorist attack in her head when someone just like made some offensive. Comments, I got I to right? stop you. I, well, I mean, yes, but she fabricated the story from January 6th. Oh, of course. So that's what I, I'm saying. It's not an overreaction. It's it's deliberate fabrication. Um, I, could be both. Could be both, right? That's that's kind of what I'm like. A big problem on the left that I see is people exaggerating the nature of everything that happens. They're like they're so obsessed with being a victim, everything makes them extra victim, and that's why I was just asking the question, right? Because I don't know that much about this. I was just sort of posing it as a question, which is. Is it not their perspective that this thing that nearly happened would have been absolutely awful and they really, 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 really want no. to prevent it from happening again? No. That, that would be like the, the more reasonable argument but from that, their side. But, but just, it's just but you not don't agree. Well, no, I mean, it's, it, when you look at AOC's story from January 6th. Which, oh, it's, it's bullshit. But, but I mean, totally fabricated. Uh, I agree. Not, not just BS. She altered the timeline of what happened. Right. She literally fabricated the circumstances. Yeah. There's, look, which people who have been through trauma do, right? fabricate yeah, memories, stories memories absolutely. Absolutely. A, a day later absolutely you, that's, you, that's what happens that's why you can't get witnesses she to faked having handcuffs the other day yeah that's what that's what people do man but that's, that's not trauma that's malicious evil it could be both well it's, it's come, a come on like it could be laziness you're staring at a politician who has overtly and repeatedly fabricated things and been caught doing it i agree and 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 you're like well maybe it's you know what? it's not trauma she's doing it on purpose because it gives her power it gives her followers she gets attention from it i How mean you know the that? big example here is that she is got there's a couple of video clips of her changing her accent based on who she's speaking seriously to, right like for oh, AOC, the democrats have been doing that for years they talk down to black people when they're talking to them we know right, that, right. right? So, but, so the fact that i mean if you would make the assumption that the, the numerous times AOC's fabricated stories, and I, I can give you like five at the top of my head, mm. that it's all accidental or the result of trauma, that is a conspiracy theory. Like <laughs> that, is, that is on par with like, you might as well go buy a lottery ticket because if all those things are coincidences, you've won the lottery by now. No, the simple solution is if, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, you've got a duck. AOC, she lies. She lied when she led the protest in the financial district to get Amazon booted from New York. And then when Amazon jumped out of New York, dropping, I think, what was it, like $30 billion in so, revenue over 10 years, mm. she goes, I had nothing to do with that. I, it's not even my district. You look at January 6th, you look at changing her accent, you look at faking her handcuffs. The woman literally just fabricates things with a smile on her oh, face. I agree with you. So it's, to, to say that's the result of trauma, though. No, I'm not saying it's all the result of trauma. What None I'm of it is. What I'm saying is sometimes people... Uh, exaggerate their experience, sometimes deliberately, sometimes not. Do you see what I'm saying? Oh, sure, sure. And, but like, so I think with her, it's both. But there's a difference between... She's a politician. Of course th she lies. There's a difference between exaggerating and fabrication, sure. right? Exaggerating would be like, if AOC said that um, when the cop knocked on her door and said, where is she? Hmm. She got scared because she didn't know who this person was and hmm. felt threatened by it. I would have been like, that's an exaggeration probably. Instead, she claimed she thought that the rioters got to her a full hour before the rioters breached the building and no one had any idea they would have done that. That's a fabrication, not an exaggeration. Mm. Like no one even came in the building. She turned one circumstance into a different circumstance because she, she had hindsight. She knew the circumstance of the day and she knew most people did not know the timeline. So when I saw that story, I said, this doesn't make sense. Mm. She thought they got in her building. And what do we hear from conservatives? They were like, AOC wasn't even in the Capitol. 
the fact checkers come out and say the Capitol is connected to those buildings by underground tunnels. And then I said, and her story took place an hour before anyone breached the Capitol in the first place. Did she, was she psychic? Did she know it was going to happen? The reason the cops went to her door was because they were evacuating over a bomb scare. She did not know. In fact, she had just gone out for lunch or something. Mm -hmm. Why was she hiding in the bathroom? She fabricated the story. When someone came and knocked on her door, she claimed she went and hid in the bathroom. Why? There was no breaching of the Capitol. She's just sitting in her office one day and someone knocks on the door. She's like, I better go hide in the bathroom because she fabricated the story. I agree with you that witnesses to crimes can, under stress, Mm. misremember things and things become uh, confusing or hyperbolic. But with AOC, she has a track record. I mean, I still think Mm. about her photos at the southern border where she's crying and it turns out there's nothing there. Like she is a master of political theater. And I think in certain points that served her well. And she knows that to a certain extent her voter base isn't going to question her anyways. Like she could say anything and they'd be like, you go, girl. Let me see what your skincare routine is. My desire to play devil's advocate has got me defending AOC, which (laughs) I I had no no intention of doing whatsoever. (laughs) Well, let's let's jump to the next next story, the escalation in this. Check this out. This was... uh, uh, huge breaking news yesterday. Lee Zeldin, a Republican from New York, someone tried to stab him. Uh-huh. And they're saying it was an alleged stabbing. And I'm like, there's a picture of the guy holding, uh, I don't know what it's called, but it's got two blades on it in his hand as he's like going. And then Zeldin's holding his arm back. You watch the video first. The guy didn't run full speed and jump up. He casually gets up, walks up to him and goes like this and then gets his arm grabbed. Almost like he didn't really want to do it, but I'm not going to say that. He went for it and got mm. taken, you know, pulled down, thrown down. This dude got released immediately. Mm -hmm. Which Lee Zeldin predicted that night. But we're we're talking about a man who attempted to assassinate, at at, at minimum, attempted attempted to stab in the neck a a, a Republican running for governor, Mm. and they just cut him loose right away. How is it? it? I thought that only happens in the UK. That's New York state law. It's interesting because Lee Zeldin, one of his major platforms running, he's challenging Kathy Hochul, is that the crime laws in U- in in New York are terrible mm. and that they don't keep people safe who need to be kept safe. So it's just irony of irony that he was like, I can tell you, he said this at 1.30 in the morning, like under New York state law, this man will be released. And yep. he was completely right because he knows the law. They charged him with attempted second degree assault. Mm-hmm. You jump on stage to a sitting member of Congress, when, when a sitting member of Congress is there with a blade in your hand and go for his neck and that that's it? Um, I, I... <sighs> I've heard some like arguments that he was actually reaching for the the microphone and that the blade. You see, it's not oh, a- and you watch the knife the because the governor uh, um, Zeldin said that he said you're done to him before mm-hmm. he came at him. Maybe he was going to try and grab the microphone. Well, why does he have right. a weapon in his hand? See, if you're approaching a guy blade. with a weapon, it doesn't that's make any sense. Attempted murder. I've heard other people say, "Well, well, those are like self defense keychains. They're not that serious." But it's like, why would we sell them to women for self defense? That's what they are. If you're attacked at night, they want you to be able to hit your attacker and have more force. I mean, it's it's a very strange thing to do. And it is even stranger to me that he's not, just on the street. Do you have a picture of the blade? Yep. Yeah, let me see. I'm I can pull it up on Twitter. This is wild. I'm not, uh, I'm not going to provide a defense for a guy who jumped on stage holding a blade and going after a sitting member of Congress. And right? telling him he's done. Uh, that allegedly, I don't know. Yeah, so it's uh, like... Who Perhaps. knows what that is? Is that I, I don't know what it's called. People probably know what it's called. It's got two spikes on it. You hold it between your fingers. They're self defense keychains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. And in the in the video, you can see his arm go up and around towards the neck, mm-hmm. and that's what a lot of people reported that he he took a swing at, at at his neck, at Zeldin's neck, and then they grabbed his arm, and then someone bear hugged him and pinned him down. Mm-hmm. You jump on stage wielding a weapon, saying you're done, and then move your arm around with the blade in it. Like, dude, come on. Um, is there no, a video no. of it, of the attack? I guess we'll call there it an is. attack. There are some floating along. Along yeah, along you can't you can't see that much. But you, you can you can look it up. It's it's you know, a little far away, but you can see him reach for it. I just think regardless, this is uh, here's what I think of this guy. I did some digging into his into his background and his family and stuff, trying to find out what I could about him. I don't know a whole lot. Um, and this is based on some of his family, but it seems like they're default Democrat types, like naive, ignorant, not really paying attention. My, my personal assumption is that this guy is probably a dude who watches MSNBC and CNN. Here's the rhetoric. Here's what Hochul says about Zeldin being a big lie, Trump insurrectionist type. And so he's like, I better do something about this. You know, it's like, so he, so he goes out there thinking he's going to stop this guy. Mm. Radicalization. This is what I wrote about in the Newsweek article about January 6th. The reason Raskin included me out of context in his video is to drive escalation. 
they they so already we have had people uh, people I work with, people who work for me and and people I know say they've they saw like the reason that the Newsweek article came to be is because I got hit up by Newsweek and they said the moment we saw you in that clip we knew it was like like something's not right here and they're like you want to write about this and there were a bunch of people who hit me up and said like my family saw that and they were like whoa that's the guy you watch mm. and they had to explain to them that it was fake that they're lying about this. Mm. But it's radicalizing people. Well, this is the point I made earlier. If you remember when we started with Bannon, it's like this worries me because your country is being radicalized against itself. It's, it, and the two sides are being encouraged to see each other's enemies. You talk about it in warlike terms. It's a war. We have to destroy them. And this is what you end up with. People going on stage trying to stab politicians. Although, I tell oh, you, uh, there, there are people on the right who are certainly saying stuff about like the Tree of Liberty and things like that. The people on the left are... Uh, you, you have the establishment left, which is the Democratic. Mm. They're the ones calling for conflict. They're the ones saying, like, arrest them, shut them down, mm. take away their votes. And then you have the leftists, the socialists, who just, they've always wanted a revolution anyway. So yeah. they're like, bring it on. Then you have the, you know, more fringe elements of the, of the right side that are saying tree of liberty and, and crazy stuff like that. But then when you look at the prominent right and, and middle, which is unified, it's totally opposed to all mm. the conflict and violence. So I think the, the, the main issue is, what do we talk about when we talk about uh, the, the civil war or whatever? It's usually like a national divorce. Can it be peaceful? And how do we prepare for it to protect ourselves against attacks, mm. not to attack? You look at the left and they're talking about how to go and arrest people and, and shut them. And, and they're, they're mocking Bannon. They're wielding the power of the federal government uh, against the previous administration, they are wielding law enforcement power to destroy their enemies. My worry is, though, Tim, is if you think about this story, right, if that politician who's a Republican, right, if he gets stabbed, that will radicalize people on the right as well. And this is the process. You're right. if you go from one to another to another. And before you know it, everyone wants to kill but, each other. But maybe radicalize, radicalize isn't the right word. If we, I mean, we literally just saw someone try to assassinate Brett Kavanaugh. Mm. These leftist groups broke the law and the AG did nothing about it. And everybody asked him, like, hey, you know, this was illegal. And he's like, don't care. Then someone, then I, I said this, if you do not uphold the law when it comes to protesting at this home, they will escalate. Of course. And the next step was the guy showed up with the crowbar and the, and the rope and the, and the <clears throat> taser or whatever he had, pepper it, spray. It really is like a fire. If you don't put it out, it just keeps growing. Well, if but you I'm, don't but, enforce the law equally for both sides, you have no law. It, right, it's right. But here's what I'm going to say. It's not radicalization when, when. We just had two assassination attempts in the span of mm. like a month or so. Mm. For, for, for someone on the right to be like, I better bring a gun with me, it's not a radicalization. It's not them saying they want to kill someone. It's them saying, I don't want to be killed. Mm. I watched the video. I, uh, I don't think he's trying to kill him. He walked up to him and then he started talking to him and actually backed away a, like a half a foot and then started to grab at him. So it was an assault. But the, he would have walked the, up with and, a blade in his hand. Yeah, he yeah. like walked up and started talking. But to But why him. does he, he need to become c go armed? And the right. other thing, to Tim's point, is you that see the, his arm go around for the neck. Uh, they struggled. Yeah, it, no, it, he, he, he would have killed up if he wanted blade. to kill him. He would have walked up and killed him really That's fast. That's not true. You don't walk in up fact, and start talking to someone uh, if you want to. You are wrong. Kill in him. fact, the most effective way to 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 do it is to do it slowly. Uh, not on stage and running at security. someone immediately gets you tackled. Oh yeah, his approach for sure. But once he stood, got up to him, he just stood there and started talking to him, and then they struggled. I'm not going to say I know what he was thinking, but he had a blade in his hand and he motioned for his neck. And people often make these mistakes because they base their views on movies. In a movie, you see the guy jump up and ah, I'm going to get you. When you look in real life, assassinations could be very, very simple. And uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you about uh, I was you ever see those theaters, those theater events where they have the ninja and uh, or actually is a better example. I'll start this way. You ever see those those comedy routines where there's a black, a black background on a stage and then the guy will get fake slashed and then his body splits because it's actually two people wearing, you know, a white, white mm. pants and a white shirt, but then they're wearing all black. The, the idea of, of why ninja wear all black was because they would do plays. And to make the ninja not be able to be seen on, on stage, he would wear all black against a black backdrop. Then when they popped out and did something, you go, oh, it was a ninja. In reality, ninja would dress like a farmer. If you want to infiltrate to assassinate someone, you have to blend in, not wear all black. And they would do other tricks too. And they would calmly approach, not psychotically run up full speed and scream, ah! They'd walk up very calmly and, and smile and wave it. So, so what really you're saying is this you. guy's a ninja. What I'm saying is <laughs> that, that right there, you cannot determine whether it was an assassination <clears throat> attempt because he walked slowly or not. It's true. In fact, but, I think walking slowly is, is more... Is, is, yeah, but Ian, if a guy like walks up to you with that thing on his hand in the street, 
you'd be worried, right? For sure. If someone approaches me on the street, I'm worried. But right, right. <laughs> but it's but it's but it's I'm not ready even, to run. For real. This is you're on stage, and when this guy gets up and walks over, he's wearing like a veteran hat. They're thinking like, what's happening? I'll tell you another story, famous story, uh, or I should say, maybe apocryphal urban legend. Uh, a security guard was in a bank. Three guys walk in with with ski masks on and rifles. And, th- and they just walk right up to him and say, drop your gun. And he goes, oh, he drops it. And then they rob the bank. And after they asked the security guard, why didn't you do anything? And he was like, I couldn't believe it was actually happening. Like, I don't know. They, they, was, they walked up to me and just took my gun. You want to play? Have you want to play this no. clip? Zeldin. We oh, we can't. We can't play an assassination attempt on YouTube. Okay, dude. I see what you're saying. <laughs> Zeldin addressed it. And he said, like, I could see this guy coming out of the corner of my eye. Like, I could see it had, he had a hat on that maybe had a veteran's thing. But, like, when this is happening, you can't really stop to be like oh i'm gonna reason with him like you just have to deal with what's going on and like grabbed his wrist things like that i will also note that the hokel campaign specifically called out this event in an email saying like it's it's a, a maga republican bus tour that big line lee yep. is like like they drew attention to this event they radicalized uh, people and then pointed them in this direction yeah because that's the big i mean t- we are a very divided country mm-hmm. and especially in new york you see it as uh hokel lining up behind a lot of the more liberal policies that New York has carried through the pandemic. And then Zeldin is an, a vocal Trump supporter. So they are a perfect contrast. And to have this become something that's happening in their state, and then for him to correctly call out that the guy who attacked him is going to be released, like it doesn't look great. They're not really looking for a, a mediation between these two mm. sides. Mm. Who got Hochul put put there? Like She after- was a lieutenant governor under Cuomo, and then Cuomo resigned. She took over. So oh, she's okay. running to be elected. She was she assumed the the, the spot afterwards. Mm. Didn't Cuomo want to run again or something? I think so. Yeah, he's like, I'm going to come he's back. He's never going to leave. I'm going to run it yeah, into the ground this time. Yeah, but I think this, this, this is the stuff I've been talking about. And it's funny because, you know, I'll say something like, I think we're headed towards a civil war. And four years ago, people said that was stupid. And then I was a moron. And then I was like, bro, I don't know. I just read The Atlantic. And they were like, we talked to security experts who said the United States is headed for a civil we're war. We're in a and fifth generational world war right now. and we World have war. The- Yes. See, the other day you were arguing that it wasn't. Now you're saying it's a no, world war. No, I'm very com- convinced we're in a fifth generational war, meaning it's a cyber war, a war of the mind and the spirit, and it is global. It's corporations in all countries making you think it's from another country. It's 14-year-olds in their parents' bedroom in the middle of wherever they live. Uh, and it's everybody. is is Not everybody, but it is a lot of people vying for power uh, digitally in, in, in the cyberspace. And they want, they would love to see the United States shoot itself, but, um, you know. How do you combat A lot that? of people would. Better a lot spirit. Of people would. Better. Better thoughts, China ideas, would. communication skills, better emotions, staying calm. I don't know if there is a, there is a way to solve it. It's, it's, I think there's, it, it may end up being some kind of natural selection phenomenon where those that are, have the, the, the perspicacity to see what's happening start preparing for the winter and those that don't will starve in the winter. You know what I mean? I think it's it's more of a common threat issue. If you guys felt that you like, if an alien invasion happened, suddenly we'd stop all this bitch fighting, wouldn't we? Right? No, I, I, don't, yeah, sure. I don't think we, so either. I think we we'd give no, some people to the aliens. We had a pandemic. Yeah, and that did not stop. It, it, you think it, like it, it, it hyper, did in, in the UK? It did for about three weeks, and then when we we back to went back to the culture war, but it did. Uh, I think a genuine uh, for yeah. If if aliens came. Threat. You'd have the left being like, we need to accept diversity. And the right being like, they're literally invading. And they'd be like, you don't know that. They're bringing us technology. And what if the aliens are transphobic? Maybe not. First, they well, would, wait. would be the right being like, hey, these guys aren't so bad. They'd wait to see what CNN told them to feel about the aliens. And then that would be the and, cult. And the mindset. aliens would come down. And everyone else would be like, what are you doing? The aliens would come down and go to the uniparty establishment elites. And they'd say, we're going to give you immortality, cures for all your diseases. We're going to give you levitation boots tell your people to serve us and they're gonna go done real real talk though what would you guys do if aliens came and we're peaceful and we're like we're here to coexist but i wouldn't i don't think aliens that would come would be peaceful ever yeah that, that doesn't seem like they're and in a situation that they were and they came and they're like we're here to help we're what could here, you do what could you do you, you you do what you're doing and live your life and and, and just try coexist and... with them you wouldn't no, work no, no, to no, destroy you just, them just deport just, what, them what do you mean coexist with them well Lost the aliens are DC. like their motherships in the sky they're like we're here we're gonna stay here with you we want to stay here with you and help you and live amongst you and they're super peaceful. They're beautiful. Would you accept it? And would you like, okay, now we're working together? Do you think you together? could trust them? If they were like, we're well, here to help you. It's good. If they're like, legitimately just peaceful and, and I, I, okay, I don't care. Same. 
Like, you'd wait, what, be what? down to just live and coexist. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a mind. You know, it's a, if, if a thought if experiment. If they're living peacefully and like bringing technology and you know whatever, it's just like because oh, like wow. the American colonists when they came and the Native Americans, they were totally peaceful. For I mean, I don't know if they were totally peaceful. No. They were very peaceful to a lot of them. No, they, they were, weren't. Thanks for helping us live throughout the winter, learning how to bro, grow corn. Bro, stop. Not stop. all of them. I'm not saying all of them. No, the, the story you're ta- talking about also does not end well. Well, there were pe- like Cortez in Mexico was very peaceful at first with the Aztecs. Okay, said the Aztecs. It was Cortez was there's was so the much was, there bro. at first and, and in the Incans the um who is it Pizarro I think went down with the Incans they loved him they accepted him he went he befriended the emperor and then they ex- they, they captured him and executed basically yeah. they took him prisoner yeah everybody secretly. just fights so if the aliens came and they were like yeah we can help you put us in the White House would you here's 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 no, but here's here's, here's the issue I have with that like you think they're gonna be people they're like let's just say aliens show up and there's a gigantic ship and it's filled with uh, it's filled with water, and the aliens are gigantic fleshy sacks with no eyes or ears or mouths, and they consume by sucking water in like filters. But they're also they also have big brains. We won't even we won't, there's no communication with them. Also, like, we need water. So if they suck up all the water, we're dead. Like, well, no, they, they don't filter care the water, this. like 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 you know a filter, a okay. ocean filter. Humans are pretty xenophobic. I think the humans would eradicate them on arrival. Every every species is xenophobic. Well, this is why I said to you, it would never happen that they'd be peaceful because if they made the effort to come here, there'd be a reason for it. I think they'd start taking stuff. Right. My my idea. I want to do a short film where an alien ship comes down over New York, and then everyone's like, "Wow, aliens!" And then you know, someone's they 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 go up onto the skyscraper and they look and they're like. You know, come make contact. And then all of a sudden, a gigantic laser beam just slices a building in half and then attract, and then it just falls and a tractor beam grabs it and strips, rips all the copper and metal wiring out and the rest just crumbles and falls to the ground, crushing people. Then a bunch of ships come down and start mowing down buildings and ripping out the metals. And then people are like, oh no, they're attacking us. And then it switches to the perspective of the aliens. And it's just some fat lumberjack alien going, we got a big crop here. Just get the critters out of there and then we'll just strip the, the copper out, bring it back to the ship. Like we don't go there and negotiate with squirrels. You know, we don't we don't we don't go into the fields of wheat and negotiate with the with the field mice and the bunnies. We don't care. We I just agree. wipe look, them all Look out. at the history of human beings, man. Anytime a group of people has moved from one era to another, it always ends the same way. Yeah, it's uh, whoever whoever has the power to sustain their 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 group, their tribe. 100 percent. So, you know, if that's life as we see it on Earth. And it's indicative of most life, like invasive life, uh, invasive life organisms take the opportunity to invade when they can, but natural predators curtail them. Why would any alien race coming to Earth be any different? It's possible they could be. We just have no reason to believe that based on life on, on yes, Earth. Yes, you hear that, aliens? You would be fools to come here. First, send us a message so that we can chat Consider, before you but arrive. The difference is there's no intelligent life we've been uh, able to uh, a technologically advanced intelligent species that we've been able to to work with but take a look at how we deal with whales like whales are intelligent very intelligent I, and we just shoot them and kill them I and just you know i read a story about whales that they're actually land mammals that went back into the ocean they evolved on land and then at some point yes. crawled back in uh-huh they're freaking wild yeah that's why they're mammals well, underwater that's my derail for the day all right let's talk about uh where this could potentially go then instead of the world falling apart it could be gutted Trump reportedly plans to purge the deep state if he wins next election. We'll use executive order to strip employment protections. That's about it. They're saying up to 50,000 employees could be fired. Uh, I'm voting for Trump. That's it. That's all. You, 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 you say that to me, good sir. And I'm like, OK, I'll vote for you. There's a lot Trump could do wrong at this point. I'd still vote Come for him. Come on, baby. Take this me back. Right I won't hit you again. Come on. No way. He said he was going to do it the first time. Not like this. Trump actually did implement executive order schedule F. And then Biden reversed it. So Trump began the process of trying to fire these guys. These 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 bu- bureaucrat administrative state people have have protections. But I'll tell you this. It doesn't matter. Joe Biden is spitting on us and beating us over the head. And my worst case scenario is like this guy's promising to do better. It's already bad. Plus, under Trump, the economy was good. I'll take it. What but else? What about your DeSantis push? See, that's what I was saying. I said, I don't think DeSantis would fire everybody like Trump would. And then all of a sudden we get a report that Trump wants to fire everybody. There we go. Do you think Trump's listening to you? Do you think that's what the... That's the, what happened. Yeah. I said, Trump, fire everybody. And then Trump was like, I think I'm going to fire everybody. <laughs> yeah. What if DeSantis said it? he's going to fire everybody as well? Would you vote for him over yes. Trump? Well, maybe. The thing is, that is big. And if DeSantis said he was going to go in and fire everybody the exact same way, that's a huge advantage. I don't know, though. I think Trump's got a bone to pick, right? I think what really makes me believe Trump would do it is he wants revenge. 
That's it. DeSantis would probably try to negotiate and simmer things down and then get taken advantage of because that's what Trump tried doing. He's like, I'm going to drain the swamp. He gets in and then says, OK, OK, we'll, we'll bring Bolton in. Fine. <laughs> Got knifed in the back for that one. Now, I think Trump, they, they really, really went after him. I think he wants revenge for Russiagate. So it's that. It is his anger over Russiagate and, and being impeached for Ukraine gate, where I think he's going to go and it should be like, you're fired, you're fired, you're fired. Ron but, DeSantis doesn't need revenge. But then what after? Like, if he fires well, everyone, is he gonna going say. to be trusted? Like, can we can we believe that he's going to install? Well, it kind of matters after that. Like, if he well, that's what I was going to say. No, do why does do you really want a guy who's angry and wants revenge as president oh, of the United States? I don't, yes. I don't mind the anger, why? but like, if he cleans house in the first year, uh-huh. what happens after that? How do we know that he's not like... We have less like, government. Yeah, but like, how do we know he's not going to be advised? We'll just just let this guy come in and then it's kind of all going to go back. Like, I, how do we know that he's going to be able to reinstall something? Because I think rock bottom exists. Mm-hmm. And I think what we've looked at with the Uniparty over the past several decades is so far down, we've hit mantle. Mm-mm. No, rock bottom would be like fallout. We don't, that's fallout. Not, like the fallout universe, the video game after this like post-nuclear no, apocalypse. No, I'm, 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 I'm talking about with, with the corruption of our government. When Marjorie Taylor Greene told us that there's like two people sitting in the house and then they're just like, yay, passed. Next bill. Uh, what was that? Uh, is that a yes? Whatever passed. Did you know that that's what they do? Mm-hmm. They, 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 Congress doesn't even go in to vote. It is so broken at this point. OK, you're fired. Get rid of all of it. And then it's like, but 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 then we'll have no government. I'm like, OK, you have not you've not made a negative point yet. That's a net positive, in my opinion, considering how bad it's been. Now, there's there's the potential that Donald Trump appoints a bunch of authoritarian fascists. It's not going to happen either. Donald Trump was going to bring in people like Peter Navarro and Cash Patel, who we've already seen, who are actually pretty good. And so it's like, OK, he guts. They're saying that they don't have to gut 50,000 people just enough to where people stop being corrupt because they know they'll get purged. It'll straighten things out. All right, well, I'll take whatever I can get. The system's already broken, right? Someone already stole my TV. I don't got a TV anymore. Donald Trump says we're going to go in and we're going to we're going to arrest all these people and get them out of there and we're going to deal with the police department I'm like, "Oh, whatever. I mean, my, my, my stuff's all gone. Do it. Do something." I think the system's always been kind of janky, like put together by duct tape and string and then the American Constitution was pretty cool and it makes it run. Like the the engine is turning, everything's okay. It's pumping out a lot of carbon, but you know, it's functioning, even though it's held together by duct tape. And if you don't constantly like, keep patching it up, it's just going to break and then fall on the ground. So we're in that stage of like, why is it shaking so fast? I don't know. I don't want to touch it. I'm going to get killed if I get near it. No, it's we got to do something about this. You know, maybe maybe the transmission is a little bit old on this old rickety country and you got to take it apart, clean it out and reconstruct it. You know what I mean? Just put but it back together. In order to do that, you got to stop the machine for a little while. And, and that's Trump not firing possible. Everybody would be fantastic. Isn't start. that what the work think? The, the country what? needs to just be broken apart and start again? No, they think you need to take the transmission out, shatter it to a million pieces, and then try and put some... And, and build leave, a new one. Or right. put nothing in place. Mm. They think this machine is producing carbon and needs to be pulled out, and then we'll be great. And you're like, you need the machine. So we have a machine that works. Works really, really well. It's a brilliant system of government. We just need to get rid of the, the gunk that's stuck in it. You know what I mean? And just pull it out and throw it in the trash. They want to just shatter the machine. They have, they have no replacement. I, I, what I see is... Uh, Trump, another Trump term brings this whole thing that we've been talking about today 10 levels further. You're getting closer to civil war, much, much closer. They've already written articles saying Ron DeSantis is worse than Trump. Mm. Numerous. They will. Of course they will. So if the argument is that Trump winning escalates it. Well, they're claiming Ron DeSantis is worse than Trump. So wouldn't that escalate it more? One article doesn't mean they all believe It's not that, one article. Right. It's numerous articles from numerous personalities all coming out in lockstep, knowing over the past several months, they're saying Ron DeSantis is even worse than Trump. Ron DeSantis is, he's got the, the sly, slick tongue, which makes him even more dangerous. Like they said Trump was worse than Hitler. How many times? Mm. If that's the escalation they have, Trump is bad. They're trying to claim DeSantis is worse and they've been doing it for months. If, if DeSantis wins... It's the same thing. It's 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 not changing. We need we need to just have someone get in and fire these people and shut it down. That's not that's not good. There's no there's no. So what's the alternative? Let the let the corrupt gut the machine and sink the ship. Term limits for administrative staff and Congress people. uh, Convention of states. But perhaps. Yes. That's what they're trying to do. Convention Mm -hmm. of states amendment for term limits on the deep state. I, I just I don't see how any of these things 
stop the escalation. A convention of states would be the same thing as Trump getting elected. If we could get the governors together and actually be able to convene on a regular basis, enough of us govern governance, we could take control and, and solve a lot of issues, I think. I think it's mostly a cultural thing anyway. It's like we all know politics is downstream of culture. It won't change until the culture changes. The culture, it can't be changed because there's two distinct fortified cultures. Sure, but this is not the first time in history that's been the case. Well, I mean, typically throughout history, when you have two distinct worldviews, they don't just come together and shake hands. Sure. They wipe the other side out. Mm. So right now we have one culture that thinks children should get sex change surgery and one side that thinks they shouldn't. Mm. I think I don't think there's there's not really a compromise there. You have one side that that thinks there should be abortion post viability, elective abortion post viability and one side that doesn't. And there's no compromise. And there's that's it. There's none. I don't, I don't, I don't see how you convince when, when right now uh, you've got Twitter and Reddit saying you can't call people groomers, and they're actually, you've actually got people grooming children. You've got a government administration official saying we should give sex change surgery to children. Like, dude. But they call it affirmation. Guys, you know I agree with you on all of this, right? Sure, sure. You know that. Uh, my concern is, again, just speaking as an outsider, I, I don't comment on American politics in the sense that I don't live here, I don't pay taxes here. It's your country. You do with with it what you want. But the conversation I'm hearing here and with a lot of other people that I meet <clears throat> is like this conversation takes you to a point of no return. But, but there's there's no This is what I'm hearing, right? This, this is why I've been saying I think civil war is inevitable because there is no circumstance. Let me give you, look, do you like the NHS? You're from the UK, right? Yeah. Do you like, it's, it's called the NHS, right? It is. Do you like it? It's hard to, it's a hard question to answer. Some of it is good. Some of it is terrible. Um, do you prefer it? Like to what? To, to a private system like we have in the United States. Well, I've never experienced the American system, so I don't really know. Would you give it up? The NHS. Like if someone came in and said, we want to abolish it outright, would you agree to that? Depends what they put in in. in we don't place. have a plan. We just want to get rid of it. No. You wouldn't do that? No, because I want to I Well, come on, compromise with me though. Like, right? We, we'll, we'll, how about we get rid of it and then we'll negotiate on what the... Re- no. Okay. Let's talk about what you're proposing instead. My proposal is to gut that system because it's evil and wrong. And replace it with? Well, we'll figure that out when it comes to it. Not interested. So it doesn't matter what you're interested in because we're going to take it anyway. And if you don't listen, we're going to throw a brick through your window. Mm-hmm. That's that's the point being made right now in the United States. I hear you. So when someone comes out and says, we should be able to terminate a, a viable baby at eight months if, if we want to or not, there's literally no compromise. But that isn't the law, right? So there is it a is, compromise. It is in, in, I think, seven states and D.C., yes. Yeah. And then you have, I think, what is it, how many states have totally banned abortion? Is it six? Well, there's a lot of block to it because of the judicial challenges, but I think right. it's six in total. So we're getting to that point. There is, it, it's... No, but they're the, not trying to mandate that at the federal level. You can live in a state where that isn't the case, right? The Democrats are trying to mandate at the federal level that you can abort a baby post-viability up to nine months, yes. That's what Roe v. Wade did for us. Right. Well, no, made it a federal no, issue. But it, but if, Roe v. Wade made it so that you couldn't ban abortion pre-viability. Mm. So uh, it, it was initially a trimester standard changed to a viability standard. Democrats tried codifying a bill that would allow for elect. Uh, it, I, I shouldn't say elective. Abortion in the instance of health of the mother up to nine months. But there's, there's, there's a trick there. Abortion would mean uh, it said post. It said uh, a, a, uh, it would allow for a, abortion of a viable fetus in the instance of health of the mother. And so the issue there is, if the fetus is viable, it can survive outside the mother. Why kill it? Why legalize the killing of it? So the, they're like, if, ma'am, if you keep this baby for another week, you'll die. So we're going to kill the baby. We could deliver it. We could do a C-section. Mm, now nah, we're going to kill it. So the question is, okay, maybe, maybe there's a moral argument to why they wanted to do that. They don't have one. They don't give me one. I've asked numerous progressives. They don't post it online why they want to do it. And so the only thing I can say is they're trying to find a workaround to abort viable, ba- like to kill viable babies. I, I, but I, you have a system in place that prevents that from being the federal law, right? It could be unless, fe- the, unless the Democrats the de- tried to make it federal law. No, of course. But you've got to be able to coexist with people with whom you disagree in the same society. So the issue is that I'm saying the disagreements are untenable. There's no compromise. There's no circumstance where, well, so, so the compromise was the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Conservatives saying, how about your state can do what you want, our state can do what we want. The problem there is that's one more domino being knocked over towards a civil war. Because the scenario I've presented is what happens when a man and a woman hook up, woman gets pregnant, and then eight months later, she says, you know what? This guy is not right for me. I'm going to go terminate the baby. 
in Texas, it would be illegal for her to do so. And I, I think it may be Oklahoma where they have, or, or it might be like Idaho or something. I'm not sure which one. They have, a, they have an abortion trafficking law, meaning that if you aid or traffic in abortion, uh, abort efficients or tools or, or helping someone get an abortion, it's a crime. How will Texas deal with the fact that there's a man saying she kidnapped my baby at eight months gestation who's viable and could survive if we just deliver it instead of killing it? I'll take it. She can leave. And she goes, no, that would tie me to you. I'm going to go kill it instead. What happens? When she flees to Colorado for an eight month elective abortion, which she can get, and the father in Texas says, Texas government, please help. She's kidnapped my son. How, there's, there, I don't see a solution there. Hmm. I mean, the, the way I see it is to try, trying to explain it to pro choice people would be imagine a woman kidnapped a baby the day it was born and then went to a state where they were going to let her chop its head off. They'd be like, but it's a baby. And it's like, right, right. The conservative pro-life people view it the exact same way when it's in the womb at eight months versus when it's out of the womb at eight months. So what do you do when there's no federal intervention and the states are forced to decide how do we save that child from execution? Does Texas invade Colorado or do they tell the guy, sorry, she escaped the state? No, I think what might happen is Colorado would demand, I'm sorry, Texas would demand Colorado extradite. Colorado would refuse. Then Texas would say, we're not going to allow people to cross. You know, we're, we're setting up a checkpoint now to make sure that people can't do this ever again. And then you'd see state borders popping up. And then you'd probably see vigilantism. The dad who doesn't want his son killed would probably get a posse together. Who knows? That's the escalation without federal intervention. And there isn't any anymore. So the compromise was, we don't like abortion, but we'll let you do it. But now you have people fleeing to go do it. And it's going to create more tension. That makes sense. My point is, uh, you're going to have to work this out, man. You just are. That, that's the situation you're in. Or, but see, a lot of people talk about civil war who've never lived through civil war. You don't, oh, yeah. you, you don't want it. Trust oh, me. And that's why the, the veterans are the ones who are like, please stop. Right. We, we've seen right. conflict. And so that, that, that's what my take on, certainly in the UK, is like, yes, the woke have gone crazy. The progressives have gone crazy. And some of the response on the right bothers me too. There's got to be a way through. Okay. Um, compromise. What level of child sex change are you okay with? Um, I mean, you're, you're picking on a very specific issue. I, we can talk about it for half an hour. There's probably some kind of compromise. For, for example, I employ several people who have gender dysphoria, right? If they want to transition uh, at the age of 16 with parental consent, do I? I don't even know. 16, 17, 18, where should that line be, right? Well, that, we're, we're talking about you know, seven-year-olds. No. That, well, kill, children can't consent. Well, they're transphobic because this is what they're doing. This is what they're doing in the United States. I, I, I and know. The, and the government came out and told parents right. to do it. And Biden did the same well, thing. Well, see, here's the thing, right? We had a guy on from the Tavistock Clinic in the UK on my show on trigonometry who was basically a whistleblower saying what, all, what was happening in this clinic. Well, guess what? The arguments that people were making about that, exposing what was happening, now the situation is being rode back. Laws are being changed. People are actually getting... Uh, to a healthier position on that issue. And I think we're making progress, right? So I do think lo- shining a light on some of this stuff will help over time. But if you want an instant solution, yeah, you're not going to get it. So I, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying there's an instant solution. I'm saying you go to someone and tell them something very simple like, hey, I don't think children can consent to this stuff. I don't think they mm. know. And they call you a transphobe bigot and try to get you banned. I've they, been there. Trust me. Uh, it was Mario Lopez who said mm. three-year-olds don't know if they're transgender, and he was forced to issue an apology. The, on this front, it has only been expanding in, in, in the direction towards child sex changes. Not only. Not, not in the UK. Not it's in the UK. UK. We, we're, 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 making, we're making progress, right? The, but this is what I'm saying. You, you're not going to get straight to where you want to go right away. But we are seeing people winning cases in court saying that, for example, the belief, I don't know if you followed the Maya Four Starter case. Mm. Uh, It was a case in the UK where basically she was, I think, fired or denied a promotion because she said that trans women aren't women or something like that. Right. And the court actually found in favor of her and it's now a protected philosophical belief or whatever. So you can make progress by what we're doing here, which is having a conversation, exposing certain things to the light. And that is the way you do it. Uh, unless you want civil war, unless you want people to die in the, in the hundreds of thousands. No, of course not. I don't think you do. This, and that's which why, is why I'm saying the focus you know, should be on how do you get to a better place. Can I? But, sorry. Okay. I was going to ask, uh, with Boris Johnson resigning, yeah. how are the other political parties in the UK reacting to that? It's very hard for me to imagine, you know, we don't, if a president resigned in the US and then whatever party was in power got to just pick a new one. It, it's hard for me to imagine 
Americans going through that system. Well, wouldn't the vice president become... Vice the, president would become... Yeah, right. But for you, Boris Johnson stepped down. Yeah. And you guys just get to pick... Well, we're a parliamentary system. We don't elect a prime minister. Right. We, elect, we, we elect the parliament. But it's interesting. We, we have a problem in the UK now because what happened was Boris Johnson resigns. There is... Uh, the way that the elections happen is the MPs, the members of parliament, mm -hmm. pick the two top nominees and then members of the party pick from out of those two. Right. And what they did, of course, they had a great candidate who was super popular with the membership. Who was uh, No, no, no. She's very unpopular with the oh. membership. Uh, Kemi Badenoch. Oh, uh, Badenoch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she is incredible on all this stuff that we're talking about, the trans stuff, the cultural stuff, brilliant. And so, of course, they made sure that she didn't. Yeah, get she it. never polled in the, even in the top four. She right? never got into the final, even though with the membership, she would have been 100 percent the winner and she would have been prime minister. They, they forced her not. So it, it, we got to, big to, problems, Tim. I'm not disagreeing to, with you. you to, know go, to go back to your point about, yeah. you know, having a discussion and compromising. Mm. We've uh, since the start of the show politely invited people on the left to come and hang out. As a vibe, we've all been through this. I get it. Right. They don't. They don't. And yeah. the other issue is. We've also sat back and let them literally murder people mm -hmm. without without accountability. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Figuratively murdered people. It's not no, legal murder. Literally murder people. What are you talking like about? When uh, Aaron Danielson was shot oh, twice. Oh, I thought in the you were talking about abortion. Or when when th well, don't make well, it. Well, they didn't. They didn't. When there wasn't legal, they just got released. What do you mean? What? Like they would catch and release these people. Right, I'm saying there's been, there's been there's been murders without accountability. There's been oh. violence without accountability. There was uh, two billion dollars in capped damage in the summer of love, the riots. There was the 529 insurrection, and then you know, with all due respect, you're here saying, well, we need to have a conversation and compromise. I'm like, Bro. I never used the word compromise, by the way. Okay, but sorry. Carry on. No, but, no, it's fine. But we gotta have a conversation, right? A hundred percent. It's like, okay, well, dude. I'm sitting here minding my own business. Mm -hmm. I get out of the cities. I say, please just leave me alone over and over and over mm -hmm. again. And then I'm told, well, if you don't talk to these people and what's to talk about at this point, I retreated and they're still burning down, throwing bricks through windows and trying to assassinate people. I agree. I agree. So, That's completely wrong. But here's I, but, he, but there's, me out, there's no conversation with people who are defending. You don't have to have the conversation with them. Here's what I'm saying, right? The society is made up of about 7% of people who are progressive, crazy, blah, 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 right? And there's a small bunch of people on the other side, on the other extreme, who are crazy equally. Everybody else actually is in the middle. Now, it depends country by country what that middle looks like. I don't know. You tell me what that, the, how big that is in the US. The, the, so in the UK, I'd reckon that's 80, 85%. Those people are the vast, overwhelming, silent majority, right? And I think they're coming over to our side with every single one of these instances that you're talking about. And to me, I don't want to talk to the crazies on either side. I'm interested, how do we get the sensible people in the middle to see sense, to stop legislating for all this crap that we've got going on and actually have policies that make sense for the majority of the people in this country? Because the majority of people in any country are not crazy. And this is why we may be seeing a red tsunami in November. That uh, Latinos, for instance, yeah. in, the, in the Rio Grande Valley, they're all. But this is the the election of Trump. This is the election of Trump supporters and and uh, Trump Republicans. His endorsements. What what do you know? What his ratio is on endorsements? Trump's like a hundred to ten or yeah, something. Yeah, it's it's some crazy number. I don't know it off the top. So of my head. what's happened is Donald Trump is a moderate. He's just bombastic. His policies were that of like a late nineties two thousands New York Democrat. Now it's considered conservative. He unfurled a rainbow flag at the, I think it was the RNC or something. He's the first president in U.S. history to support gay marriage before being president. Even Hillary Clinton didn't support it in mm -hmm. 2016. So you get this moderate to be president, and he woke up a bunch of regular people. The neocons hated it. He was moderate in his policies in most of them. He wasn't moderate in his behavior. And that's what, well, that's what <laughs> triggers them. You know that, right? Exactly. Right. And so people who are based on, who, whose decisions are making is based on emotion, they couldn't stand no. what Trump was. No. But the people who are flocking to him, they're flocking to him because he's saying he's going to nuke the gut. He's going to fire all these people. He's going to purge the system and people are sick of the broken system. Mm. And what, what's what's fascinating is the Democratic Party is becoming wealthier and more white. Mm -hmm. And they are the second most pressing issue for Democrats is political extremism. That's why Democrats are screaming abortion and January 6th. Mm. But regular people don't care about that stuff. Right. So this is why I think they're they're the Democrats providing funding to Trump endorsed candidates is a ridiculous mistake. And what's going to end up happening is when Donald Trump invariably wins. You in think he's going to win? I, I, well, we're an, we're an eternity away, but I don't see how the Democrats could beat Trump at this point. Mm. So it, look, we got two years. 
Joe Biden's aggregate approval record low has has gone gone lower than Trump's lowest. So right now, objectively, Biden is hated by more hated more by America than Trump ever was. You put Trump up against that and he's going to be like, hey, I got mean tweets, best numbers of our lives. So that's what Jim Cramer said. Remember that dollar 84 for gasoline. Remember that it was like 213 national average, but we saw it go down to like 150 in some areas. Yeah, people at this point are going to be like, don't take a ham sandwich over the Democrats. But what do you think happens with the, the, the wealthy elites in the Democratic Party who know they're facing probably criminal investigation and prosecution like Hunter Biden? He currently is. Well, this is this, this was my point is I, I, I'm worried, first of all, that if Trump does get elected, he's not going to get a lot done because they just won't let him. Right. That's what I, happened with the first term. Well, that's my point. So why would it be easier with the second term post January 6th? Well, they think this was this was unleashed. Right. So that's the thing. But look, come back to my point, which I think is actually. You tell me how true it is, because I don't know that much about the United States. I don't live here, right? But I do believe there's a sensible majority of people in the middle who are there to be won over by either side, either side, as long as they start talking sense on a lot of these issues, right? I, I think, and I th in the UK, that's what happened. That's what happened. It depends on the data. What the, the, the data that you look at right now? I think the latest data I saw in in, in factioning, it's it's a bell curve. So it's actually not eighty percent are in the middle. It's 30, you know, 20 to 30 percent are in the actual middle. And mm -hmm. then you have left leaning, right leaning. Then you have left, right. Then you have hard left, hard right. What we saw with Pew was that the sideliners, the, the regular people are actually, you know, I think it was like 15 to 20 percent and they're center right. So like be, it's obvious when you look at what the left is mm. that regular people would be center right relative to them because you need you need a baseline for what the left is. And mm -hmm. clearly the, the regular people aren't there. Um but I think these people, for the most part, still aren't wanting to to, to vote outside of the Democrats or, or vote for anything. They, we saw this in 2018 when I think it was 31 moderate Democrats got elected in Trump districts because they promised to actually entertain real issues. And then they just went for impeachment and they just became culture warriors. Mm. And it was like abandoning regular people. But I don't know if these people, uh, you, you, I'll put it this way. I don't know. I don't know how big the middle is, if there even is one. What we saw from Twitter trends was a hype. The, the middle was flattened out and spread far left. Mm. What we saw from Pew Research was that the middle out, the, the, the middle has been flattened and now spread. The, 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 mod, the middle of the left is mm. far left and the middle of the right is a little bit more right than it used to be. But the, there's no, it, it's a valley in the middle now. Well, I mean, on Twitter. <laughs> Twitter. No, no, I'm talking about Pew Research. Yeah, yeah, yeah I hear It's you. a valley, not a, not, not a bell curve. Yeah, I hear you. Maybe this is the way in which our countries are different. But I, I do think that... Um, one of the reasons people on the center left would never vote Republican in the conception of it as it has been is because of the way that Trump was. They, they may well vote for someone who's a little bit more not sensible necessarily in terms of policy, but sensible in terms of the way that they comport themselves. This right? might Because, you know, that triggers the hell out of them. Well, this right? is why maybe DeSantis. That's my point. But that's my point. We, we need to fire the administrative state. It is the biggest threat to this country, in my opinion. It is it is it is. The swamp does not convey the slime and, and and putrescence of the corruption in this country. I don't think you can fire them, though. I agree that it's a problem for sure. But if you go up and you're like, I want all 10,000 of you to be fired tomorrow. They're like, well, we control all the spy networks and all the sub you know, military machines wait, like wait, wait, you wait, really wait. want us to you're really going to try and get us, dude. We're not you we're not, one guy. We're, we're not talking about that. We're talking about civil servants. We're talking about people who work in administrative offices. They run the CIA. Those are the I'm people that run the, 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 they're, they're, the they're, shadow yes, government. Basically, Trump wants to appoint a new head of the CIA and FBI. That's different from the, the general civil servants, the two million of which operate in all facets of government. And yes, Trump's attempt was to schedule F them so they would be fired. So my point is, rather than be like, you're all done tomorrow, be like, you've got term limits now. You've got two more years to finish out your term. Well, the idea would be to fire the people who are redundant and replace them. Wait, if they're redundant, you wouldn't replace them. Oh, right. Re fire, the, fire the people who are unnecessary. I'm open to that, but we should cycle them out Which in, is like, almost all in two them. years rather than come I in mean, and be like tomorrow's. I don't, I don't think he would really all in one day be like everyone go, but I think it would be in quick succession. It That's fast, why I yeah. gave like I was like saying like, if he can do it in one his first year, let's say Trump gets reelected all of 2024. He's cleaning house. You know, it's not like it's all over one day. It's not like when they replace the White House, but very over the course of 12 months, he cleans out everyone who needs to be gone. My question is, who are who is filling in the ranks? Even if he downsizes the government, who is coming in to replace you, them? You might not need to replace them, as, as you know, as Ian pointed out, if they're redundant. 
or unnecessary. And then right. would we pay as taxpayers just pay their their retirement packages? Just basically give them like a, a bail like a bailout and send them. No, on I their think way? they should get unemployment. And go find another job. Unemployment. Yeah, um, like anybody else in this country. I am concerned with what you're saying, Anna Claire, about who's coming in next because. And I don't want to be too hard on Trump, but one of the things I, I really bothered me about Trump was the way he handled COVID and he, how he just handed power to Fauci and was like, this unelected body can now control the, the whims of the people and make decisions. I'm like, I didn't elect Fauci. I don't, I, didn't, I don't want Fauci in this medical industry deciding what I have to do with my daily life. That's great. Medical tyranny is as dangerous as banking tyranny or as martial tyranny in a lot of ways. What bothers me more about it is who is attracted to that kind of bureaucratic federal position. I mean, in some ways, you're not running for office. You're getting appointed and maybe you lead a department and you oversee the budget and you get to sign the paperwork that can really make a tremendous difference in people's lives. I mean, I just I have such skepticism for the way government works. It's not that I don't think we should continue to fight to make the system work or fix it where it's wrong, but like. I just don't know who is applying for these jobs, even if Trump is in office. I, 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 that kind of person, or the, historically, those people are, uh, I don't know. They don't. Did you, did, uh, do you know about the war game they did, the Boston Globe reported on in 2020? Mm. It was like John Podesta, Hillary Clinton campaign, some neocons. They effectively played what was D&D. &D. This is really funny. We should totally do this, by the way. <laughs> they, they did a Dungeons and Dragons on the, on the, on the, on the 2020 election. And so they were like, okay, John Podesta, you're going to play Trump's campaign and so-and-so, you're this campaign. And then they took turns deciding what they would do, rolling die to see what would happen. Yeah, it was crazy. I think that's what they did with, with yeah, like it was like D&D. &D. Wow. Yeah, we should totally do it and film it. It'd be <laughs> so fun. Awesome. And uh, uh, I'm, I believe it was in, in this war game, I can't remember who it was. It might've been Podesta. They, they, they said that the West Coast should secede from the union if Donald Trump wins another term. Should or would? Should. They, should they were trying to encourage washington oregon and california to secede so i i think about stuff like that and i'm like why even literally entertain that as like they thought that would happen is that what they thought would happen so it was like i i i, I don't know exactly who was the one who suggested i don't think it was podesta but someone in the game mm. suggested secession so you know what i'm looking at is when i've been reading a lot about the first civil war for instance texas apparently joined the confederacy out of uh it was a geographic necessity. They needed a trade partner and they were blocked off from the rest of the unions. They're like, we don't know what else we would do, I guess. Maryland wanted to join. Uh, there was a, the sentiment in, the, in Maryland was to join the South, but they just couldn't do it for a lot of reasons. One was that the union went in and arrested 31 reps in the state who supported secession. And the rest were like, we'll do whatever you say, man. And then Lincoln suspended Hapia's corpus in the corridor from D.C. through Maryland up to Pennsylvania so they could arrest whoever they wanted without charge or trial. Really crazy stuff. Mm. People don't understand the depth of what happened with the Civil War. They assume it was like all these states got together, high-fived each other, and said, we're not the Confederacy. Mm. When what actually happened was a small handful seceded, and that was the end of it. Then Lincoln gets elected. Then Lincoln gets inaugurated. He was elected. His election resulted in this. He immediately says, session is illegitimate and we're coming for you. Uh, the, the battle at Fort Sumter starts. Then several other states were like, yo, this is getting crazy. We're with the other guys on this one. You're a tyrant. So it could be that Texas bans abortion and everyone says, well, this is crazy. Colorado has unrestricted. That scenario I pointed out earlier occurs. And everyone's like, it's just two states. It's just two states. And then another state says we're cutting off all trade line supplies and contracting. If you are in, imagine this, in Texas, they say any business that operates in Texas is no longer allowed to operate out of Colorado. We will not allow transactions to the state, to any banking institution in the state because they kidnapped children and murdered them. Things like that might start happening. Mm. Then you might get, you know, the federal government coming in and pressuring Texas and Texas saying you're, you're pressing up on our laws. Then all of a sudden, Oklahoma is like, yo, this is crazy. What are you doing in Texas? And then goes to provide aid to Texas. One by one, you'll see dominoes falling down. No, I hear what you're saying. And this is why we're having this conversation, because what I'm saying is people in positions like yours and mine who are having conversations about these issues, I think the way we've got to look at it is what is the outcome that we're trying to achieve or the outcome that we're at least trying to prevent, right? Now, if we accept that civil war is bad, do we accept that? It's terrible. Right. Worse than bad. People Awful. don't understand. One of the bloodiest wars in history. Of course. Brother and it would be brothers. way worse now than it has been at any time in history before. The, the, I'll, just, I'll just stress this, man. It is, especially with Antifa, these people have never seen grievous injury. I, uh, the, you know, uh, I, I, will, I will say trigger warning 
for, to, for people listening, because I know there are people who have dealt with real trauma, and I mean this like a, a real trigger, mm. not some stupid, you know, oh, no, it's offensive word. No, I've seen people whose legs have been turned into ground shuck. And the feeling you get when you see that kind of stuff or the feeling you get when I, when I saw, when I saw the first time I saw a dead person being car carted away from me in, in a conflict, I, it's, a, it's a feeling that I'd never felt before. Mm. And I was, uh, sure. what was I, 27 years old. And it was weird. 27 years old, and I was like, this is an emotion I've never experienced. Now, I, I imagine back in the day, it's an, it's an emotion people experienced quite a bit because people mm. died you know, yeah. in front of them and there was war. And we grew up in this safety bubble. So I tell you, when these Antifa people actually see it in front of them, when they start to see that, it's going to change. It's going to it's going to twist their brains in ways they did not expect the feeling they get. But it may it may make many of them more radical. A hundred percent. So that's what I'm saying is we got to work back from that civil war. Bad, very, very bad. Right. So how do you avoid it? Well, the way you avoid it is you find a democratic solution by targeting the people in the middle who are actually quite fed up. They're quite fed up of all this crap that's going on. Uh, they're quite afraid. They're worried about speaking their mind. And we give them permission to do that. We make it okay. We challenge some of the legal changes that are being made. This is the process we're starting very slowly. Some people would disagree with me, even in the UK where I come from, right? But we are making some slow progress. And I think that's the way you do it. You target that middle, you bring them on board, <clears throat> and then you avoid the terrible thing that we'd all like to avoid. I, I do agree. I, I agree with the strategy. And it, it I, you know, some people say it's pessimistic when I'm like, I think it, it may be inevitable or the dominoes are falling over and that seems to be the, the outcome or it, it, we're in some kind of civil war as it is, mm. fifth generational warfare. But it may be pessimistic, but at TimCast.com, we're certainly trying to do that, right? Yeah. So when we were starting, uh, when we were expanding the company, I took a look at a bunch of what other, what other companies had done. And you look at every single commentary and podcasting network, and what do they do? They load up on commentators and get a big roster of commentators who all have similar opinions. That's not what we did because my goal isn't just to make money. My goal is to affect change. So the first thing we did, I think the first show we launched was Tales from the Inverted World, which is paranormal, true crime, mystery with Shane Cashman. Because I said, what we want to do is we want, uh, we want to create a space where people who are hearing nothing but this stuff can kind of chill out with fun entertainment. So we're not just creating a hyper polarized commentary space. Right. We launched Cast Castle, comedy mm. and silliness. We launched Pop Culture Crisis, conversations about celebrities and gossip so that it's, a, it's, a, it's an eclectic space. So people who are worried about this stuff that we're talking about, they'll have a space to actually talk about normal things. And the culture we want to build excludes the woke insanity and Antifa. They won't be a part of the world that, that we're trying to create. Mm. So what, what I'm hoping to do is we're running ads right now. We just launched one simple ad so far as a trial run for Tales from the Inverted World. We saw tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous uh, um, uh, results among 18 to 24 year old men and 65 and up women. Mm. So 18 to 24 year old men, we get 18 to 54 year old men on this show really, really well with the spike being, I think, 25 to 34. 18 to 24 is low. So getting a big response on Tales from the Inverted World is huge. And 65 year old women, not to mention women across the board really responded well in the ads. The reason this is good is I want people to come to TimCast. I want them to see these stories and be pulled away from Disney and Netflix and Hulu and the weird woke stuff. Mm -hmm. And then just watch Pop Culture Crisis and Cast Castle and the other shows we're going to launch, comedy specials. I don't want to, to, to bring them into a space that is dominated by conservatives or even libertarians screaming the end is nigh. It is bad enough that that's what we're essentially doing. So we want to create a space that slowly starts carving out Something that's more relaxing. I love it, man. I think that's great. And we are doing that. This is the same thing with trigonometry. We've got big plans because culture is at the core of this, right? Comedy, humor, music, entertainment. That's the way you do it. Uh, you can scream about politics all day long and you can change some things. But culture, that's where you get masses of people who are not political, but who do, you know, they feel like they can't say what they think at work or they've got some kind of other issue going on and they don't want to be a, a, a sort of cultural warrior or in this space. Uh, I think comedy is a big part of it. That's why we do our raw shows and we make fun of everybody left and right because that's how I think you get people to that from that middle to that middle. And I, know, I think it's really great that you're doing that. We're going to try that. I mean, you look at, you know, Daily Wire, they're obviously very different to what we do, but, um, you know, they're, they're making movies. Yep. Right. This they is, get it. Th it's, this is how you do it, man. The Daily Wire is not making conservative movies. Right. Exactly. I don't want to watch a conservative movie. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to watch a work. I just want to watch a movie and relax and have a good time. Exactly. That's what I want. Exactly. And I don't want to hear about 72 genders while I'm at it. Just leave that out. 
show me the movie, I'll enjoy it. And I think that's the way, man. So I'm really glad we had this conversation, actually, because I think this is the way we get to a healthier place by trying to get to a healthier place. Because I hear you, I wake up sometimes and I'm like, holy shit, this is going down the toilet fast. Yeah. But the only thing you and I can do, all of us in this room can do, is try to make it a little bit better one step at a time. The way I see it is uh, building an arc. And uh, maybe there won't be a great flood, but we'll have this big, really cool community space mm. that people can come hang out in. Yeah. If, the, if, if the end result is the world falls apart and everyone's fighting, well, TimCast.com will still be producing a plethora of content from a variety of subjects. We are going to be launching more political shows mm -hmm. of like slightly different political persuasions, but still similarly in the libertarian kind of space. But I, I don't want to just do a bunch of shows about politics. It's like we have a show we talk about politics. We want to do other stuff. We want people to be able to just get a. I want people to say, Disney Plus, get what go broke. I don't like this. I'm going to give my money to TimCast.com instead. 100%, man. Now, for both, the Daily Wire is, is light years ahead of us, for sure. Mm. They have like nearly a million subs. We're nowhere near, nowhere near that. And they've got um, multiple commentators. They've got, I think, five movies now. Uh, uh, some shows are coming out. They announced uh, Chip Chilla, their kids' show. I'm, I'm deeply jealous of everything that they're doing. But, you know, we're working on ours, and, and we focus on what we're doing. We, uh, Daily Wire is going to get their way before us, for sure. But I'm just saying this. There are people who, who, who become members because they believe in the mission. But that's not enough. What we need to do is just have the better show. We need to get a show. We need to get to the point where we have a comedy special. And then people are like, they, they, they go into work one day and they're like, oh, did you watch that new? Sh have you seen that show, Cast Castle? I've been watching this hilarious show on uh, TimCast.com. Like, no, what is that? It's like, oh, you, you, it's, like, it's like a show. You know, it's comedy. It's funny. It's, that's what we want to get to. So then people are like, eh, uh, Disney Plus is boring. That's the way. That is 100% the way. And you know what happened to, to the mainstream of the comedy industry in the UK, right? What happened was they had these great shows that everybody watched. Uh, 15 years ago, Mock the Week, Live of the Apollo. These were shows that everybody watched. Everybody wanted to be on as a comic. And within about 10, 15 years, they've really ruined them. I think from what I hear down the grapevine, they're going to they're be not renewed. And it's happened wow. to other shows as well. Because and, and here's how well, you do it. It's very simple, right? You stop employing people based on merit. You start employing people based on their <laughs> various characteristics. And then you make bad stuff. And then you make bad content. Yeah. And then people come along and go, hey, well, we've got the internet. We've got the technology. We've got the talent, the skills, the comedic experience, whatever. We'll write our own thing. We'll make our own thing. That's the solution here, man. What, what happened with Doctor Who? I remember when uh, they, they, they brought in the woman to be the first female doctor. And then what I had heard was that the show basically became Magic School Bus. So like instead of, instead of an episode where they go to, a, I, I rem the one episode I really remember fondly was when the robots had killed everybody and they had the smiles. Do you watch Doctor Who? I don't. There's an episode where they go to a planet and then it was um, Peter Capaldi, I think, was the was the doctor at the time, the older mm. guy. Is that his name? I don't know. But uh, the robots all had smiley faces, and the robots killed anybody who was sad to stop sadness from spreading. And that was like an interesting plot. Mm. And then what I heard with uh, when they when they brought in the woman, the plot lines were like going to India to talk about partition and like colonialism. <laughs> and it was like, okay, like, you know, I want to see a dragon fight a time wizard, not learn a history lesson, but right? If you want to make magic school of us. And so I don't know exactly what happened with it, but I, I, I heard it like it wasn't doing well. Yeah. People didn't want to watch well, it. Well, I'll tell you how bad it got. So I was I used to write on the equivalent of like Jimmy Kimmel or whatever. It was called the Mash Report in the UK. And I would watch the program only when I was involved in it. And I would only tend to watch like five minutes because the rest of it was just this like preaching. No jokes, just preaching. Uh, there was some good bits. There was a few comics that were good, but and th that's how th they're. So to me, when I see that, I think that's great. Let them destroy this thing that they spent decades building, <laughs> and let us come in and build something better. That's 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 way. That's I the way, it. man. That's what I do. I only listen when Tim reads my articles. And then I stop. <laughs> exactly. No, right. I'm just kidding. But the youngest generation of I think Americans. I don't know if the poll was done globally. They said if they had if they could only have one social media platform, they'd have YouTube. Of course. And YouTube, really? I mean, you you are probably wow. a great example of this, has so many different creators. It's, you know, if you are interested in something, any niche thing out there, you can find it. I mean, TikTok has really mm. evolved into this too, but this was bef this poll was done, I think, in 2017, and they all pick YouTube. They watch YouTube more than they watch television. And yeah. again, that is specific power to creators to be able to reach an audience that is really interested in what they and have. There, uh, real quick, there, there's something interesting too that I want to mention that um, we talked about earlier today. 
because we've we've heavily focused on treating Timcast like a subscription service. Uh, the goal is just to make content that's content that's sustainable. And some people have pointed out we could put the uh, our episodes on other platforms instead of requiring a membership. You could just buy the episode for a couple bucks or something. And I was like, that's actually a really good idea. So there's still a way for some of our content to to be on these big platforms in a way that that they're, they're supported. But I will I will add to that idea too because people mentioned it like, hey, can you make the Timcast uncensored segments you know available for one off purchase? And it's like we don't we don't have the tech on, that on the website. We could build that. And we can't do it on YouTube because YouTube would ban us. So what we're trying to do with YouTube is effectively be a pipeline Mm -hmm. where someone on YouTube will see us. They can come to the website and get unfiltered, uncensored content. Bingo. And this is what I think is happening in the in the media online space is it's kind of like when the printing press was invented. Before that, the church had complete control over literature, which was the Bible, basically. Right. Then the printing press comes along and suddenly you've got the ability to make a newspaper. And a lot of the people who now own a newspaper are not people who had any control over that space before. Right. So you've got uh, essentially the same thing happening now where people like us are creating new platforms now. You're going to get your own platform where you've got the entertainment, you've got the comedy, you've got the movies, you've got the political analysis. And that, and I think a lot of the, the companies that are going to get built in the next five years, they're going to be the next big things that actually end up being some of the biggest contributors to the space. And you're part of it. Well, so you know, what's, we. what's fascinating is the amount of money that Netflix spends on making a show makes me just laugh. I know. Because you can you can make good shows really, really cheaply. Right. And so I, I'm not going to, to, to claim that the shows we have on TimCast.com are the greatest shows of all time. No, they're better than that. And everybody should sign up. <laughs> uh, I think, I think we're, we're, we, we start, it's a little rough, hmm. and we're trying to just earn our place into doing better yeah. and better and better, better and f- figuring out what works. And um, it's, it's, it's relatively cheap. It's expensive, don't get me wrong. But compared to what Amazon and Netflix and Hulu pay for shows, I'm just like, we can sustain a full show with only a few thousand paying members, whereas Netflix has like what, a ridic- like tens of millions or something like that. And then their shows, they're like, it costs us millions to make and then we canceled it. I'm like, we could make a show and it, it, we, we could make some show, some podcasts. We could make a podcast that only has 1,000 paying members for mm-hmm. the podcast and the podcast can exist forever. Because that thousand thousand members, I mean that's that's ten thousand bucks a month. Then we pay the podcast hosts, and they're they're good. There you go. We made the investment. Your shows forever. So if there are people who like the show, and there are people who like the job, and the, that's the best the show can do, why cancel it? And then I look at these other networks, and they cancel it, and I'm like, I don't know. If if the, if the fans sustain the show, the show can be forever. This is what's interesting about the way the the, the model used to be that. TV shows on cable needed a certain number of viewers, otherwise they were canceled. And the fans would be like, no, don't cancel. They'd say, sorry, 300,000 fans isn't enough because the ad dollars doesn't pay for this show. If those 300,000 fans paid 10 bucks a month for the show, the show would be making a massive profit. Mm. And then they'd be able to make the show even better. I think this is why the Daily Wire made, made the big shift and they're focusing on VOD content because they were like, you don't need that many people to support you to make a massive platform and be successful. So that's what I saw too. And I said, the ad model is less effective than the, the passion model. So let's just make content that works. I, saw, I thought of it like this. I was like, you know, we've been treating it like a bakery trying to give away a million free cakes and then telling a business, but we'll put your name on the cake mm-hmm. and pay for us instead of just being like, hey, the cake costs five bucks. You know, if you, if you want it, buy it. So we're, we're, we're doing a two-pronged approach for sure. We want to make free content, Pop Culture Crisis. You can watch it. There's Super Chats. Timcast IRL, it's free. You can watch it. There's Super Chats. And then we direct you to the premium model con, you know, stuff mm-hmm. where it's like, hey, if you like it, buy it. Yeah, it's awesome. And this is how you change the culture. And that's why I'm, I'm going to make you an optimist by the end of this uh, conversation. Well, so, you, this is how you change the culture and then things will change. Well, so I guess, I guess my point is I'm not entirely convinced that what's to come is going to be, when I say civil war, um, I don't know if it's going to it's going to be the way people the way it used to be like a fifth generational civil war is people posting memes online. This could be it. Right. The fact that we do shows, we argue our points and other people go on TV and lie and try to manipulate. Mm. That could be the extent to which war exists internally in, in, in our in the modern era, because violence actually turns people off when Black Lives Matter after George Floyd was killed. Black Lives Matter net support hit like 50 something percent It was mm. crazy. 50, like that's nuts. And then they rioted and it tanked to like 9% net support. They lost all of their PR gains. Violence did not work. 
And so I'm like, you know what does work is false flags, mm. like framing your enemy, or you just make something more fun, more entertaining, and something people want to be a part of. So it, it could be that the conflict we're in, this is the peak culmination of it, and it doesn't get to the point where it's, you know, people shooting each other or something. Yeah, even though I'm not that optimistic, but I <laughs> hear what you're saying. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm saying maybe. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what I do know is that we're in a conflict. And you can call it whatever you want. No question. Well, and there are huge shifts. I mean, Netflix, it lost like 1.3 million U.S. and Canadian subscribers recently. Like, people don't like whatever system is out there. And the Daily Wire is at a million. Yeah. Mm. Well, this is what Who I've been thinking think they poach them from? a lot about, right, is what has the Internet enabled? And I think what it has done is it's, you know how TV is by definition fake? Do you know what I mean? Like people are sitting in a fake place where they don't hang out. Right. They, and it's, it's <laughs> fake in every way. Right. And what happens with podcasting and things like that is we kind of weaponized authenticity. Like people watching the show know that I'm saying what I'm saying because that's what I believe. And you're saying what you're saying because that's what you believe. And they may dislike what I'm saying or they may dislike what yep. you're saying, but they at least know it's authentic. So the Internet has enabled that authenticity in a way that wasn't possible before. And that's what's making the difference. And that's why people will happily pay a subscription fee for something otherwise they would never pay for. It's like reality TV was just literally not reality. A hundred percent. Right. And this is reality TV, because if the cameras were off, we'd still be having this conversation. I mean, we were having part of this conversation before the cameras turned That's on. That's my point. And then usually it's really funny because when we're getting ready, we're doing pre-production for the show. We have conversations that I'm like, we probably could have recorded and just used because yeah. it was really good. But yeah. we never let our guests talk about anything before we do the interview, because that's where the interesting stuff always gets said if we're not recording. Do you know what I mean? Well, for us, um, it's mostly current events. Yeah. So we just have the news stories lined up and then we're like, you know, we like we can talk about whatever mm. for depending on the guest. One thing we try to do is like if the guest has a specialty or a certain thing they really want to hit on, then we'll, we'll do news. And then at nine, we'll get a half an hour in of just like, which reminds me, you have a book. You do. I want oh, to know do. about this. Yeah. What, what's the premise? Well, I talk about growing up in the Soviet union. I talk about my grandmother being born in a gulag. I talk about my grandfather being a slave uh, during those times. And I'm trying to con well, not trying to, I'm contrasting many of the things that I see in modern society in the West now with the things that my family went through. And I'm saying, like I've been saying to you, and you agree with me, this is not a good path to go down, right? And most people don't understand that the path we're going down has, uh, you know, all Eastern Europeans I talk to in the West, they all say the same thing. Like, we've seen this before. Right? So I'll give you one example. Do you guys know where political correctness comes from? Where does it come from? The Soviet Union. Right? So in the Soviet Union, they would say to you, comrade, what you're saying is factually correct, but it's politically incorrect, right? And what that meant was you were not following the party line. Does that sound unfamiliar? That's exactly what's happening. Well, that's exactly what's happening. So, AOC said that, remember? Exactly. Morally so, correct. Mo right. And what it meant was you were factually incorrect, but you were morally correct or vice versa. Yeah. And so political correctness is simply a way of getting people to do what you want. That, that's what it is. And so when I see the shutting down of freedom of conversation, the shutting down of freedom of research, the inability of scientists to say their opinion about a medical treatment or whatever, that worries me, not because I'm just like, I am in favor of that treatment or against that treatment. I'm, I'm just worried because to me, that's like an alarm bell. It's an alarm bell. And the same thing, you know, my grandfather, I talk about this in the book. Uh, he, uh, was a, he was a Soviet dissident, you could say. He said in the 1980s <clears throat> that the Soviet Union was wrong to invade Afghanistan. Immediately lost his job, ostracized by his friends, many of whom, Tim, you'll like this, by the way, said, no, no, we agree with you. We just can't do it in public. Did you see the cartoon where the guy's burning the woman at the stake? And yeah. he says, Psst, by the way, Incredible. I, agree with, I agree with everything you said. How, exactly. did, how did your grandfather speak out publicly in the he 80s? He didn't speak that? out publicly. He said in a private conversation, someone reported him, familiar too, yeah. right? And then and then that's what happened. Well, to I'll, him. I'll tell you a story. Uh, I was, when I was staying in Ukraine, I was staying at my friend's house. Mm. And it was old communist block housing, right? It's so like reappropriated as like apartments. And she said, during the during the Soviet Union, the neighbors next door were feuding with the people who lived here. They were arguing over something nonsense. So mm -hmm. the people who lived here called the party and said, "My neighbor has dis disparaged the party." The mm -hmm. next day, their apartment was empty and they right. were gone. Right, but that's what the people, people used to do. Yep. That's what people used to do, man. And this is one, you know, the last part of the book. Uh, the, the my warning to people and this is why i'm trying to hit that middle man because you're not going to get the crazies on either side you're not going to get to them you're not going to persuade them they're crazy that's that's the point right but the vast majority of people you can persuade and and that's what you know i'm trying to tell them the story so my grandmother born in a gulag and i don't know if you know this but if once you were released from the gulag 
um, you wouldn't be allowed to live in any major city in the country. You had to leave uh, to live in a small town in the countryside. And the only people that lived in these Siberian towns or the miles out of the way of anything were former guards from the gulags and former prisoners. Wow. Right next to each other. Yeah. Right next to each other. In 1953, I think, Stalin dies. And Nikita Khrushchev comes in and he's, he, he denounces everything that had happened. He says Stalin was wrong. The purges were wrong. This was not communism, blah, 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 blah. And he reveals many of the crimes that Stalin and his people did. And you know what happened in that small town where my grandma lived? Dozens of those former Gulag guards shot themselves. Whoa. Because they were like, holy what was I part of? Yeah. Right. And that's all I'm saying to people in the West. Don't be a useful idiot. Do not go along with things that you do not believe because you're afraid. Do not go along with things that you do not believe because you're going to lose your job. Do not go along with things and don't demonize people. You're not a good, I don't care if you put hashtag be kind before you said kill yourself. But it doesn't make you a good person. I'm, I'm sure some of those guards shot themselves because they were scared of what other people would do to them when they found out what they were doing. I don't think they were, man, because nothing happened to them. They, they just realized what they'd been a part of. They had a wake up call. And this is what I'm saying to people who are going along with whether it's cancel culture or demonizing people or attacking people online. Like we have a friend in London. We had him on the show, James Cavarini. He runs the oldest family run Italian restaurant in London. He did a fundraiser for Ukrainian orphans with JK Rowling. Next day, bunch of one star reviews on TripAdvisor. The day after, I'm not saying it's connected, but this is what happened. Next day, someone smashes in the windows of his restaurant. Wow. You're not a good person. You're not standing up for anyone. If that's what you're doing, you're, you're a bad person and you're going along with an ideology that is making you a terrible person. Don't do it. But that's the, what I'm trying know, to say look, to people. I've, I've, I've had so many conversations with these Antifa types. A lot of them just don't care. They're not trying to be good people. They think it's funny. That's why I'm saying I don't there's, care about them. You're never going to reach those people. But there's people. Of, uh, when and, they break the you. law, they need to go to prison. They need to serve their time. And that's one of the problems we have in our society. The law is not uniformly enforced. But this, this also means that we need to be less naive when it comes to the people who seek to exploit our kindness. Agreed. There was a, there's a woman that I knew who worked for a major publication and uh, she was an activist we were hanging out at another, you know, prominent activist place. And she told me that she just likes watching the world burn, hmm. that she doesn't really care. She, was, she said she's a total nihilist. Mm -hmm. And she was like, but don't you just want to see it shaken up and burn? And I was like, no, because I was saying, like, I understand the nihilism. I feel I feel a bit nihilistic myself. But, you know, the idea that nothing matters means that you need to make things matter. You need to make things good and better and important. And her attitude was, no, if it doesn't matter, just burn it and watch. It's fun. Yeah, there, there are people like that. And that's why I'm saying you're not going to reach a person like that because by virtue of the psychology, trauma, experience, whatever well, you want to call it. I understand. It, my, my point is you are competing against them. No, you're not because we're competing for the middle. But that's right. what I'm saying. They are going to the middle. Yeah. And who do, who do you think they're going to choose? A sensible person who says, actually, maybe just because your three-year-old said the other gender. Yeah, but, but you, you misunderstand. They're, what they're doing is they're taking a clip of you mm. quoting Stalin and claiming you, you said it. Mm. And then the person in the middle goes, I heard that guy Constantine say mm. he wanted to lock people up who disagreed with yeah. him. Like, that was freaky. And then you're like, I didn't say that. That's a fake clip. And they go, bro, I watched the video. You're lying. Mm. They told me you were going to lie to me. But the, the secret weapon in the culture war, this fifth generational world war, mm. is the authenticity. Because like right. the, the news media will shove... Antifa's message or the whatever this message this cult message down people's throat but it's like look at this cardboard box it looks like a house it's a house look how beautiful this house is and people are like I know it's not but they're telling me it is looks cool I'll go along with it I'm not gonna say anything but then they hear us and they're like oh these people are real and then it's in dispute you cannot dispute in disputation Right. I mean, look, look at Rogan. CNN went after him. What, 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 how we, what, do you think most people believe apt. Rogan or do, they, do you think they believe CNN? CNN's viewers are in the gutter, but their viewers believed them. Sure. CNN viewers believed them. Right. Right. But who, who does who does the, the sensible middle believe? That's what I'm that's what we're talking. Well, about. This, this is fascinating, too. Uh, I, I have friends who are relatively woke that like these are people like people I knew from a long time ago in Chicago. And then the last time I went on Rogan, you, you look at their profiles and it's BLM, it's the black square, it's pride flags. Mm. And they're hitting me up saying, like, that was awesome. You're so great. Like, it's good to hear from you. And then I'm just like, it's weird to me because like. All of the stuff you believe in, but you heard me and you understand that. Like, I wonder if that's going to change your mind. But at the very least, they listen to Rogan. They trust Rogan. They believe. 
Right. Th that's why I'm optimistic somewhat because do you know how many people I get that I used to gig with on the comedy circuit who hated me, who c complained about me, who criticized me when I turned down this contract, blah, blah, blah. Do you know how many of them hit me up now going, oh, I love your show? All of them. That's what's happening, man. Not, <laughs> not all of them, but a lot of them, right? Uh, so I, I think that there is a sensible majority to be won over. That's what I believe, and that's what I'm trying to do. We're going to go to Super Chats, and I, really, I want to give a quick shout-out to Adrienne Curry, because we're big fans, and she said reality TV was reality until 2003, then it died. Hmm. Reality wasn't good enough for them. Well, I think the reality was they tried reality TV, they had a positive response, and then said, hey, it's just cheaper to fake this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I, I explain this to people about YouTube. You'd see these videos on YouTube where like a guy saves a homeless person uh -huh. and it's like he brings them food and they hug and it's like, oh, and he gets 10 million views. Now you have the story of that woman. She's got a year in jail, a year in prison because she faked. The homeless man gave me $20, his last 20 so I could eat. And it was like scam and they raised money. What happens is these YouTubers were like, somebody made a real video where like, I'm gonna go help homeless people. And then they filmed it and put it up and it was okay. And then someone else said, why bother trying to find a homeless person when I can pay a guy 20 bucks to pretend to be homeless and get it done in an hour? So they just started faking it because it was faster and easier. Mm -hmm. But let's read some super chats, everybody. All right. If you haven't already, would you kindly smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, share the show with your friends, and head over to TimCast.com, become a member to support us for everything I explained a moment ago. That we're, we're, uh, uh, We've got Tales from the Inverted World. It's a fascinating show to put on on like a Sunday night with the lights turned low and you're getting ready for bed and you just let it play and it's a spooky story and it's fun stuff. And then we got uh, a pop culture crisis. We got Cast Castle, more to come. Chicken City. I'm really excited. We're going to have our rooster, Roberto Jr. on a Times Square billboard. Yeah, and he deserves it. He, he definitely it. does. He's a superstar. He's employee of the month That's every great. every month. <clears throat> great father. Employee of the month. Absolutely. All right, here we go. The Chronicles of Chris says, LOL, the thumbnail looks like Kissin told a stupid joke that Tim disliked. <laughs> also, did you read the capitalism article I told you about in the Hotep episode? I did not. I did not. I'll have to look into it. Um, and remind me of which capitalism article that was. Raymond G. Maga Stanley Jr. says, Tim, so today I directly sent handcuffs and heat-resistant gloves to AOC's DC headquarters with a nice gift note for each. I wonder if the feds will visit me. Oh, that'll be interesting, I suppose. AOC advocated for using heat-resistant gloves in protests, so, you know. Grofty says, love you all, buck, buck, buck. In the ad we have with Roberto Jr. on it, it just very quickly says buck, 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 down like the side, like in really small. And then it's two ads, actually. So the one on, on the right side is the cartoon version of Roberto and Roberto Jr. and the anime fighting. It's really funny. I'm really excited for that. All right. Were you Day always a big chicken fan? Sorry. To oh, yeah. Out. Chickens are awesome. I, when I lived in Miami, I had chickens. And then the neighbor dog kept, kept uh, killing him. And I was getting really angry because it was like digging in. And I'm like, what the? Like we had this closed off area with chickens in it. And they were, I was pissed. I was really mad. And we confronted the neighbor and then he bought us new chickens. And the dog kept trying to break in. So then, you know, we didn't know it was a dog at first. We put up a trap, caught the dog and then returned the dog to people. I was like, look at your dog. Yeah. Anyway, we got a, we got like. I just remember my first couple of days working here. You, the chickens were at the front of the house at the time. They didn't have their like sweet estate that they have now. Yeah. And you would be like, and this is Sarah. And uh -huh. this is like, you knew all of their names. And yeah. I'm like, I don't. Okay. They all sort of look brown. And that one's got. Oh, okay. I know their name. So the originals all have good names. And then some of their kids have names. Like Roberto Jr. is like the best. And there's like Maggie and Bernie and um, Isaac. But um, most of the new chickens we haven't named because there's just too many. There's so many of yeah, them. Yeah, it's like 30 or 40. My family used to have uh, turkeys uh, on a farm. Oh, and, turkeys. And they'd give them names. And we had two really big ones that were very aggressive and would always fight each other. And my family having their up sense of humor that they do, they named one Adolf and the other one Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. All right, Dalen Smythe says, Thank you for restoring a bit of my faith in some form. I don't believe in a God as a person, but as a construct, the system, everything. Think multiverse, different types of infinity and dimensions beyond perception. And that's in line with what people refer to as Einsteinian God. The idea that there is a greater power of some sort, but it's not a person. And that, that's, that's more so where I fall. Into, into thinking. I don't know what, what, what you, Ian, or, or you, Constantine. Well, think. we were having this exact conversation before we started, right? Yeah. And uh, I think Lydia asked me if I believe in God, and I said, like, no. And then I was like, hold on. No, no, no. That's not what I mean. Like, I, I don't believe in a dude in the sky, uh, but I do believe in something above us all that connects us as human beings, for sure. Yeah. Ghost Crusader says, Ian, I missed you yesterday, and I love your shirt. That is Stolas. He teaches astronomy. 
and the knowledge of poisonous plants, herbs, and precious stones. Is this is this uh this is Stolas? This it's an owl. Let me see if you guys can see that. Is that in the shot right there? Seems Beautiful. Like, seems like a rad dude. Somebody sent this to me. I, whoever that is, thank you so much. And there's gems on it as well. Is that why you like it? Is the <laughs> gems? That's the main reason. All right. Friedrich Borman says, Constantine has two good videos with Michael Svetov on SVTV channel. I recommend them for Russian speakers. And if you can translate them, read subtitles for English speakers as well. What is that about? Uh, so the, uh, Michael Svetov is a Russian YouTuber and I think politician. And he interviewed me a couple of times about how I see what's happening in Russia, Ukraine. Wow. Russia. Yeah. And he's in Russia. Uh, he's not in Russia. Oh, okay. I was going to say like, <laughs> not, not anymore. No, 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 no. But he's a cool guy. And, and we had a couple of great conversations for sure. Yeah. Like, uh, so just really quickly on that. I mean, what's the risk if you were in Russia and you were critical of what, what they're doing? Are they going to come after you? Are they going to try and shut you down? Uh, so do you know what happens to protesters in Russia? Gulag? Uh, no gulag anymore. But uh, so when the, when the Russia first invaded Ukraine, uh, people went out in groups to protest. That was illegal. They got arrested, locked up, etc. Then they went out in what they call single pickets that you go out on your own with a sign saying uh, no war or whatever. Arrested. Right, arrested. Yep. Then people started going out with no sign, just holding hands up in the air, wow. pretending to have a sign. Arrested. They get arrested. And the, the best one was there was a dude whose name is Zamir which you might know in Russian means for peace, mm. right? Uh, and he was in an airport standing with, the, with his name on a plaque, on like a little piece of cardboard or whatever. His name means for peace. And if you stand with a, with a thing that says for peace, you're in favor of peace. That means you're against the war in Ukraine. Arrested. But he was like waiting for someone to get picked yeah, up. Yeah, he was just, that was his name. Did you, did you see the, uh, there was a woman who was pro-invasion. Yeah. She walks up to the camera to argue in favor and yeah. the cops just grab her and arrest yeah. her. And she's like, no, no, I'm supporting it. I'm su right. They don't, like, we don't uh, care. Russia in, in this moment is a totalitarian state when it comes to this issue. No question about it. Yeah, Putin's been in power how long? Uh, he, since 1999. <laughs> so you think about this. When he first came to power, we were worried about the millennium bug. <laughs> Y two K. Yep. Right. What, what, he, what was he? Uh, he was. Uh, he he wasn't KGB. He oh, was, do you know how he came to power? It's a very interesting story. Do you have uh, a quick version? Yeah, I do have a quick version. So basically, Boris Yeltsin, who was the president before him, uh, needed someone to replace him that had no power, that had no power, because anyone who came in who already had power, the first thing they do is they put Yeltsin in prison, confiscate all his ill-gotten gains, etc. So he found this guy that nobody had heard of. Like Vladimir Putin in Russia before he became president had less profile than anyone in this room has in America right now. Wow. Right. No one knew who he was. And he came along. He was uh, and uh, Boris Yeltsin made him acting prime minister. Wow. And if you're the incumbent in Russia, you know what that means, right? You're going to win the uh -huh. election. And then uh, right before the election, Yeltsin said, actually, I'm a bit ill. Why don't why doesn't this nice guy take over and see what we can do? <laughs> and, and that's what he then did with Medvedev as well. Remember that? So Putin serves a couple of terms. That's when he's supposed to leave. He puts Medvedev in place. Medvedev yep. comes in, changes all the law so Putin can serve more yep. longer terms. And then they do the switcheroo back. Man. All right. Let's see. Philip Reed says, I don't know about Tim and the crew, but I'm getting sick and tired of waking up to major historical events. <laughs> You're in it. <laughs> yeah, but, but you know what? That was reality. It was like, bro, you were in a golden age, and that's why you weren't in historical events. Like, but now you are the major historical event. Well, no, no. Event. Life was always, you know, in this country and everywhere else, it was always a historical moment. Something big was happening. But things got so soft and so protected in the United States that we had a period where nothing was happening, and we were like, this is great. No. The natural state of the world is... is historical yeah events. like when you wake up are you looking to be told what's going on in the world or are you looking to tell the world what's going on i don't know pick one or do both all right let's see jeff house says your intent is wrong tim he was open-handed going for the mic near his face with a non-bladed cat ears less lethal weapon nbc news youtube channel 134 zoomed in clip love the show too much to let you get sued for libel over small details well um I, we can't be sued for libel over reading a news article that said he tied, tried he went for his neck, and it, it's also opinion statements. Yeah, I also don't think he has said what his intent was, right? Like, right, we're not sure. But I, I don't did. think that matters. If a guy goes up on stage holding cat ears, if that's what they're called, and reaches around for someone's neck or whatever, you're allowed to interpret that. That being said, if it turns out I'm wrong, outright okay, but. This is not a Covington Catholic situation where we got a small snippet. 
I watched the video of the guy walk up on stage and go around and reach around. And I saw the thing in his hands. And then I read the reports and I'm like, I don't know what he was trying to. I, so I understand maybe why it was second degree attempted assault. And that does explain it. So, you know, I will accept that for sure. I still think we got to be careful with this stuff, right? I don't know if I want to argue. I just don't think I really want this scenario playing out all the time. Like, this is wild that he just, like, strolled onto stage and was like, I'm going to carry a weapon, and that's, and that's okay. And if his intent really was to try and do a slow roll, you know, neck shot or something, mm -hmm. but masquerade as, I'm just going for the microphone. That's all I'm doing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So don't go up on stage with a with a weapon of any kind and then reach around at the guy. I don't want to apologize for what we what we saw happen, considering how dangerous things are getting. But, you know, fair point. Fair point, Jeff House. Appreciate it. All right. Michael to, uh, Tim Cisco says, Tim, have you uh, Tim, you have to get Colleen Noir or Mark Smith from the Four Boxes Diner on the show. I mean, we'd love to get Colleen Noir on the show whenever he can. That'd be fantastic. C Recipe says, I had almost 300,000 subs and 60 million views on YouTube, and they deleted my channel, Just Informed Talk, two weeks before 2020 election in YouTube Purge. I've started over with a cooking show, C Recipes. Any help for us? Well, follow C Recipes, I suppose. I know a couple other channels that YouTube deleted without cause. It's insane. Is and, it, oh, C Recipes? Is it the letter C or the, the yeah, word? Yeah, the letter C. C, re, all one word? Yeah, C Recipes. Do they like, what do they send you? Do they send you like an email being like, Bye. Well, the people, the people I saw, no, their accounts were just gone and they were really? like, no one talked to them. Mm -hmm. Alan Smith says one thing to remember about uh, with the possibility of an alien invasion is the cross contamination of viruses. Yes, but why wouldn't a virus of an alien be able to jump species like dogs get sick? We don't human, uh, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong. Do humans get parvo? They don't. Right. I don't, I don't hey, there's that. a lab in Wuhan that can help. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, my, my theory is that COVID's here to protect us from the next alien invasion. It's going to kill all the aliens because they don't have a resistance to it, but we've already built up one. Hmm. So I'm going to give them COVID blankets? Is I don't think saying? COVID's going to give yeah, I yeah. don't think COVID. the aliens will have the appropriate receptors to take on human viruses or vice versa. Well, we'll find out. I just think, like, even if an alien life form comes down and they seem peaceful, like, they are so fundamentally different from us. Like, do we really think it would be a sustainable pairing forever. Like, what if they eat their young and they're like, but we just eat our own. Well, you have a spare human child. Could I just like have it? Yeah, it didn't go well for like, the Neanderthals. It just doesn't make sense. All right. Tyler Price says, the Aztecs and them believed the Spanish were the return of Quetzalcoatl, one of their gods that was prophesied to come back, then were slaughtered. That's it. Yes, and the Aztecs also did ritualistic human sacrifice too. So it's like, you Just a couple of bad groups of people. It's kind of why you also want to shake out of like fantasy mode of any kind, whether it's like whatever you believe, guy in the sky floating down. Like if aliens do come, don't mistake it for like God, because that's like we got to take it very seriously. It could be an invading force, but also don't be flipped out by the when CNN tells you there's an invading force because there may not be one. Mike S. says, Tim, could you please ask your EU guest, what is a woman? I don't human female. <laughs> it's not hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's fairly simple, actually. Yeah. All right. Uh, er, uh, Araftus of Stet says, my dog Roxy just died today, and I just wanted everyone to know she was the best little dog in the world, oh. and I'll miss her. Sorry to hear, man. Sorry to hear. Shout out to Roxy. Bad Penny says, I hate when people talk about aliens and compare them to what happened to the Indians, but they are alien. They could just like studying new life forms. Spin the UFO, unrelated. Would love to see Jimmy from Bright Insight on sometime. I would love to see Jimmy. We talk about Atlantis spinning that Atlantis. What is YouTube doing here? All right. Michael says, howdy, Tim and crew. Constein doesn't seem to understand how divided the United States really is. How will we find any compromise with the far left extremists when they're not even willing to engage in civil discourse? Mm. Well, we've, we've sort of covered it. First of all, I think I'm well aware of how divided. That was kind of my point, right? Uh, I, but that's why I never use when we were having that conversation, I never used the word compromise because I don't think it's about compromising with the work extremists. I think it's about hitting that sensible middle that I was talking about, right? You're never going to compromise with the extremist on either side because it's not possible. They're extremists. Yeah, I think I think the solution is get people away from these big woke corporations and let the woke, woke, woke corporations suffer under their wokeness. Get woke, go broke. Mm -hmm. Do your thing. Look at uh, uh, Jeremy's razors. Man, Harry's was like, we're canceling. And they're like, we're going to make our own razor company. And then they did. And now they're rivaling and competing with these companies. It's absolutely brilliant. Hugh Jennings says, David Dorn's killer was convicted. That's right. Glad to see it. Some accountability. Mm. 
Not across the board, but enough. So, you know, or I should say enough there at least. All right. Dano says, Ian, please bring some actual meaningful conversation. We are tired of hearing you correct everyone's grammar. Okay. Let's talk about poly, uh, poly. Let's talk about microfragmentation, coral microfragmentation. Right now they say the coral reefs are dying off. If you shatter coral into hundreds, thousands of pieces, call it microfragmentation of coral. It all grows together and you can reform the coral reefs fast. You get this polycultural microfragmentation because coral reefs are lots of different animal species living together. Coral's an animal. So you need a lot of different cultures of coral when we regrow the coral reefs. That's what I was about to say. That's you right. want to give people hope. That's why I'm here. Science is cool. Yeah. It's what, yeah, yes. All right. John, uh, Jen Desi says 4,000 fired replacements in place before he takes office. Do your research. Oh, okay. Brian Page says, please buy billboards along I-95 in Rhode Island. We need more people listening to Timcast in this tiny Democrat wasteland. Oh, Rhode Island. You know, the thing about billboards is they're like extremely regionally, you know, targeting. And it's like, is Rhode Island really going to, you know, is that really a market we should be buying ads in? Yes. You know why? Because we got to plant the seeds whose shade we know we may never sit beneath. And it's the summer right now. So if you're in New England, you go to Rhode Island to go to the beach. So you're Rhode getting Island a lot of like regional traffic. Three miles wide. Mm-hmm. It's like more than that, but I'm exaggerating. It's microscopic. Hmm. So like a nice $3,000 billboard for a month all over the country. Just tons of $3,000 billboards and like semi-rural. Most, no, th- those would cost like $300. That would be epic. Let's yeah, do like bil- $10,300 billboards. Suburban and rural billboards are really cheap. Like that really might be cheap. what like, it's at next. We got we had a there, there was a billboard bought out here, and I think it was three hundred bucks. Like West Virginia billboard was like three hundred bucks from for a, I think it was for like a month. That'd be cool. Yeah. So time, mean- Times Square. I'll let you guys in on some secrets. Ridiculously cheap. Really? Ridiculously cheap. You can get uh, uh, like ten dollars per per play. So they're digital billboards. So there are some agencies where you can get you know a twenty five foot screen, and it's ten bucks per run with a ten run minimum minimum. So it's like a hundred bucks and then you go stand in front of it. Your ad plays, you get a picture of it and th- there you go. Now, if you want like a month is when you're going to start getting into the tens of thousands of dollars. So some of those bigger billboards can be, you know, like the bigger ones that are up high, 30 grand for a month. Then the, the big, the most expensive one I think is that it's like the tower or something. It's 625,000 per week. Massive, super huge. Like, what is it like? 100, 200 feet or something like that. It's so iconic. Right. And so the thing is, people. someone pointed out that there's a, a, a Resident Evil TikTok for their ad in Times Square, and you can see the edge of the Tim Cast one in it. That's why you buy Times Square. Dang, those 3D billboards. Have you guys been seeing those? Those are cool, right? Mm. I, don't, I don't know what they look like in person. I still haven't seen one in we, person. We, we saw one when we were in New York. Oh, I don't, it was right there. Yeah, actually, you're right. Yeah, Man, right those there. things are stunning. Yeah, it's super cool. It's, it's It wraps around, and then it was like a robot. Yeah, it look, looks like it's coming out at you. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah, it's super cool. Those are fun. All right. Mr. Dad Folk says, no unemployment. These bloodsuckers have sapped enough from the American people. They need to find a job ASAP if they want to keep a million dollar roof over their heads. Woof. Spicy. I know the desire. I keep thinking about, you actually brought up Shay's Rebellion last night. Thank you. I did. Because yeah. in that instance, it was John Hancock that pardoned Hancock. all those farmers. Um, and I think it's we're in the age of maybe another round of pardons against Whoever you think your enemies might be right now, kind of got to move forward together. We don't got to, but I'd like to. Mm. All right. Milo Hoffman says you don't replace a cancer tumor when you remove it. Fire them all. If something needs done, the states can do it. Mm. Yeah. You know, people are saying things like, like, oh, no, who's going to Trump? Trump's going to replace these people with. And I'm like, I kind of feel like less government is a good thing. You know, I don't inherently think less like it's less government across the board. Let's we'll figure it out. Storm Viking says Chris Hayes on MSNBC was just just was lying through his whole segment, saying the Capitol officer was killed by rioters and saying Donald Trump didn't condemn the rioting. Throw some more Jan 6 BS in. Wow. How many news outlets lied about cops dying on January 6th? Crazy. Apparently, the New York Times, they ran that story about the cop having the stroke or whatever. The narrative was that he was hitting that with a fire extinguisher. And then you find out later, it's just like it wasn't true. Hmm. He had like a stroke the next day and they're like, oh, that whoop, yeah. Uh. Well, then for a while they were saying like the stress of the day's events triggered these oh, things sure. that wouldn't have happened without them. 
I mean. Yeah. Yeah. The Federal Reserve, that was how I got my first weed card. There, I was like, tension, stress. They're like, what's stressing you out? The Federal Reserve is <laughs> printing you weed money card. out of <laughs> <laughs> You got it, buddy. <laughs> James, San Francisco. James Nelson says, once he declares, start naming appointees he would put in place and have them start lining up staff so day one they can swap out the corrupt lifers, then move agencies to cities across America. Hmm. All right. I dig it. Didn't they move the Department of the Interior to Colorado? And then they're like, we're going to move back to D.C., though. This isn't working. Yeah. It's crazy. All right. Katoth Swiss says this guy speaks as if the left is rational and open to conversation. I suppose ignorance is bliss. Where is the U.K. in regards to the groomer gangs? Well, it's an issue we've covered on our show extensively. We just had a report come out which confirmed what happened. But yeah, this is the problem, right? We had, do you know what they are, the grooming gangs? No. Yeah, 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 yeah. What's yeah especially with uh, when Tommy Robinson was covering it. Yeah, a lot of people. got arrested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what happened was basically for decades, uh, gangs of men predominantly of South Asian background, so I think Pakistani and Bangladeshi, I think, uh, were basically finding vulnerable predominantly white and Sikh girls who were not adults usually and m raping them for years. The, there were a few that were actually killed during this process. And what compounded that problem is uh, the police, the local councils, the authorities, they didn't do anything about it because of quote unquote sensitivities about race. Wow. Right. Uh, we interviewed uh, a woman, a brave woman called uh, Dr. Ella Hill, who was one of the victims of these. Uh, so the, the, the video is on our channel uh, about it. Uh, yeah, well, it, it's a terrible thing. And it happened. Uh, it, I think it's still happening to some extent. Uh, but again, th it takes time and it's awful that it happened. Uh, but we are even on that issue slowly making a bit of progress because and, now it's being talked about. But uh, I remember Tommy Robinson. Mm. He was, what, what was he there for? He was there when they were sentencing or something like that. One, one, in one of these cases, yeah. They arrested him for it, right? Uh, they arrested him for breaking the law around reporting on criminal cases, yeah. And you can't, that, that's insane to me. What law did they say he broke? Uh, I, I don't remember the details right now. I think it's something to do with the way that you cover cases which haven't been finalized. Mm -hmm. um, but so, so, you know, it's been a while. I could be totally wrong. My understanding was that the case was, the trial was done and it was like sentencing or something like that. And they're like, we don't care. You can't do this. And he, apparently he asked for permission. He was like, is it okay if I come in? I'm like, yeah. And then he walks over and they're like, okay, you're under arrest. He's like, what? I, I don't, it was a long time ago. I don't yeah, remember yeah, the yeah. exact details, but I, I, I don't remember it quite that way. But who Him, knows? I'm pretty sure he asked. I'm pretty sure he was like, yeah. is it okay if I film? They're like, yeah. He's like, all right. And then they came late. Like maybe an, a supervisor was like, no, 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 arrest him. I don't know, man. The stuff I've seen with Tommy Robinson, the government really was screwing around, to put it simply. But to me, like the idea that you couldn't report on a trial is crazy. You know, like as an American, mm. like standing outside of a court and like reporting. Oh, bro. I mean, you want you want crazy. I'll give you an example. We had a comedian called Joe Lysa who was investigated by the police for a joke he did because <laughs> an audience member. You want crazy? We got crazy. Man. We, we, in the UK, we got crazy. But. This is why we declared independence. You know that, right? <laughs> well, well done, you. Uh, right. But we don't have a First Amendment. Uh, yeah, I know. It's a, yep. big, it's a big problem. Yeah, man, I, I remember following a lot of these stories with, um, what is it, Speaker's Corner? Or what is it mm. called? Yeah, Speaker's Corner. Yeah. People were getting, like, arrested or carted away and stuff. It's right. like, Well, we've got, we've got police officers calling people up and saying, you posted this thing on Twitter. We need to check your thinking. Wow. Right. Check so, your no, thinking. See, what a terrible yeah, phrase. Yeah, 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 a guy called Harry Miller. All right. Scouty says, Tim and team, you're my favorite podcast, but please have on some actual atheists to explain their positions. There's been a lot of straw manning. Albeit incidental, I can email some suggestions. Thanks for all you do. Uh, I would love to get, we, I mean, we've had atheists on the show. We, we, we've literally, the, the, the quotes I've made about the atheists we've had, uh, I'm sorry, the quotes I've, I've said about atheists have been the ones who are on the show and said things. But none of these people I think were like atheists, uh, theologians, or, you know, uh, um, religious scholars. So that would be interesting. Like would a be. Gnostic. I want a Gnostic mm -hmm. on the show. Wuzo says, in your 4 p.m. segment, you said Swamp Monsters. My wife and I immediately jumped into the chorus of Swamp Monsters to the tune of Rock Lobster. Swamp Monster. We should write that song. <laughs> da -na 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 -na. Uh, okay, we'll grab, uh, we'll grab some more super chits. All right. 
Bobcat says, why does Tim keep preaching generational warfare as if that theory has any relation to reality? It's been debunked in Iraq, Afghanistan, and the 2000, 2020 insurrection. Seriously, get an actual shooter on. What are, you, what are you talking about? Like, generational warfare describes things that are literally happening. Gen I, I, get a shooter on. <laughs> why would you do that? What, what does that mean? I don't know. Like, like, an, like an actual combat vet or something? Um, generational warfare refers to advancements and tactics in warfare, and they're real. So, like... Just because fifth generational warfare is happening doesn't mean third generational warfare doesn't exist anymore. It still does. I think the military actually claimed there used to be three theaters of war, land, sea, and air. And then there were four, which was land, sea, air, and cyber. Now there's five. Space. Well, cyber, cyber, and space were one. What? It was land, sea, air. Well, actually, it's airspace. Land, sea, air, and space, and oh, okay. cyber. And then now spirituality is a fifth theater of war. I saw a four-star general talking about it. Let's see if I can pull that up for a later show. Huh. It's fit, yeah. The spiritual, the spiritual theater. Huh? This is actual military doctrine, as far right. as I, I was told. Mitch says, Tim, would love for Timcast to have apps for Roku, et cetera. Is there any plan? Yes. Okay. So we are like a tiny fraction of the size of the Daily Wire, but um, we have to get more members and get bigger. We've got like one dev and it's expensive. So we've been slowly rolling out technological advancements to the site to improve things. It's a particularly rudimentary system that we've built. We're, we're doing well. We're hiring more people. We just like we're literally hired, I think, like two or three more people with more people on the way. It is difficult. You know, I think we're, we're approaching like 35 employees. And so we need managerial power, but then managerial power costs a lot of money. And so it's like we can only grow as fast as we can grow. And I'll put it this way. If we had the Roku apps, we'd probably get way more members to make the Roku app. We need to grow to a point where we can hire a couple devs to make to, to build it out. And so... We're, we're, we're like effective. We're, we're bursting at the seams. We can only go as fast as humans can go and budget constraints allow. And as you expand, you grow in every direction. So it's like we get a dev, we get Roku. All of a sudden now we need content to fill it. So we, you know, we, we just start expanding. Long story short, we want Roku. We want Chromecast. We want uh, Apple. We want uh, LG TV, Samsung TV. All those apps take a long time to do. And uh, we need a mobile app. We were working on the mobile app. That fell through because we were a relatively small operation. And we are, I imagine it like we have a 10 ton boulder with a chain and we are pulling that boulder uphill. We can only go so fast, but the more people who line up behind it and start pushing on that boulder, the faster we move up that mountain. Hopefully in five years, we're going to, we're going to be bigger than Disney plus. And, you, and people are going to be like, ah, I canceled Disney plus. I'm just, you know, it's just Tim Cass and daily wire for me. That's what we're hoping for. So uh, I will say this, smash that like button, subscribe to the channel. Share the show with your friends and become a member at TimCast.com. If you like the shows we do, if you want to see the uncensored after show, you can follow us at TimCast IRL. You can follow me at TimCast. Constantine, do you want to shout anything out? Uh, I'm on at Constantine Kissin. And of course, the, the show is Trigonometry and buy my book, An Immigrant's Love Letter to the West. Where would they buy that? Amazon. Okay. I'm Hannah Claire Brimlow. You can see me on uh, TimCast. Click on the read tab. I write five articles a day and you can find me on Instagram. I'm HannahClaire.B. Ian Crossland, iancrossland.net. Hit me up on social media. And if you want to follow up on what I was talking about by that general, the four-star general talking about the theaters of war and the advancement, it's called The Future of War. This is the video. Uh, the Future of War and How It Affects You. It's by Smarter Every Day, Destin, brilliant man. And I found it, you know, you can search YouTube for The Future of War, Smarter Every Day. It's a 25-minute, 28-minute documentary that he did with his general. It's fantastic. See you later. Very cool. Thanks, you guys, so much for tuning in this evening. You guys can follow me on Twitter and Minds.com at Sour Patch Lids, as well as Sour Patch Lids .me. We will see all of you on any one of our shows. Check out YouTube.com slash Cast Castle, though it is becoming a much bigger show and we'll be moving to YouTube. I want to clarify something for everybody. What we want to do, so, so uh, hold on, listen. I go on Chicken City, right? ChickenCityLive.com. And we have these funny cartoons. The latest one we did was we asked an AI to write a story and it wrote a story about Ian being a chicken. It gets like 60,000 views. And I'm like, man, that's huge. We have Cast Castle with funny jokes. Here's what we want to do. On the YouTube channel, we want to put up like a minute gag video or like a two minute sh video short or something, you know, special from the space. And then the website, we're going to have the full show. So that's the plan. You can also check out chickencitylive.com and you can check out timcast.com for Tales from the Inverted World. It's been a blast hanging out with all of you this week. We'll be back live on Monday. Thanks for hanging out. And we'll see you all then.